dear colleagues, dear friends of the transnational executive trans and lawyering skills. Now we are at the second day of our five week and we are continuing this today with a practical exercise. And now John Sonstein has the floor and he is the leader. Take the lead, please, John. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, very, very uh, pleased to be back. It was a wonderful session for me uh, last week and uh, Professor Anderson and I talked quite a bit and talked for us early this morning about how much we learned just in the discussions. So we'll, we'll go forward today and thinking about planning, uh, opening speeches and uh, closing arguments and, uh, and then engage you in a discussion about how we can plan to this in this case. I hope you have at least skimmed part of the cartel case so we can talk about it and get your feedback. Um, one of the discussions, I don't remember the name of the judge who spoke about opening statements uh, last week and how they are not very helpful. And looking back, I have transcripts of my original opening speeches uh, back in 1968 and 69. I saved them. They were horrible. Uh, I had way too much detail. I would put the audience to sleep. Uh, it was just, it was, they were just awful because I didn't understand what it was all about and how to be persuasive. Uh, more of, most of our cases, we actually try to judges alone. And many of us are involved a lot in arbitrations. Uh, I do a lot of labor arbitration work, which is solely to professional judges who are arbitrators. And, and uh, Willow Anderson and I have talked a lot about the power of an opening speech, short and tight and to the point. And the reason I say that is I want to make sure that whoever is the fact finder can see the facts through the lens of my eyes. I don't want that person or the jury to have it through the lens of their own perspective since I don't know what their perspective is and I don't know what they're thinking. I do know it has to be short, interesting, to the point, persuasive, and so that when the evidence unfolds, uh, the, the people listening will understand what I'm getting at. Now, I know that in England, <clears throat> and we'll talk later too about this, in England, if the uh, defense has an opening speech, they will not have a final argument. They can choose. In the US, we can have both an opening and a closing, and we have to figure out who goes last and who goes first in both the openings and the closings, and it's different in different jurisdictions. So part of this planning as we, as we think about how we're going to approach this is I would step back from it for a moment and um, think about where, where I start. Now for me, I'm only speaking from my perspective. I was a criminal prosecutor. I've done defense work as well. But as soon as that case came on my desk, I would start preparing my final argument. I would start right from the very beginning to prepare the final argument. And because, and I say at the end, final argument, because I can't give an opening statement if I don't know where I'm going. So I start working on the final argument and I start talking it over and over again. Now, for those of us who are doing small cases over and over again, of course we can't prepare them all like that, but we can prepare, we can prepare our opening speech and our final argument, almost any case, uh, without knowing much about the facts. Because we know what the theory of the case is, we know what the law is, we know what the government has to prove. And our position for the defense is uh, what it's going to be. Now the, the government has to prove that the defendant committed the crime. Our theme of the case, our theory of the case is uh, based on the law. Uh, it, it, it, that's where it is. So we know that in, in the criminal cases, we know the defendant has to do it and have violated the statutes. The other side, we know what they're gonna say. He didn't do it or he did it with permission or with someone else or he was forced. I mean. We generally know in every case what the issues are going to be, even if we don't have any kind of discovery. So I think thinking about that, and then before I go in the courtroom, I suggest that we really understand the rules of the particular place where we are. If you know in advance who the judge is, 
and what the courtroom looks like and how the acoustics are and where the, the, the judge leans in certain directions, you can understand what the rules are in that particular forum. And so we have a short introductory video by three extraordinarily good lawyers. The woman on the left is a partner in a large law firm from Miami, Florida, which is the north uh, southeast corner of the United States. The man on the right is a solo trial lawyer in Denver, Colorado, which is sort of in the middle. And the man uh, in the middle is a judge in San Diego, California, which is on the middle part, so it's south middle of the west coast of the United States. Now we did this in front of a green screen. And this is the, these are some things I produced. But we put them in front of a green screen and we put them in Chicago, which as you know, is in the central part of the country. So we wanted to have a central location for these discussions. And, uh, and so it's sort of overlooking the city of Chicago, which has no bearing for you, but it does to our viewers to say that we are centralized in our approach to this. So Hassan, could you pull up that, know the rules uh, for the first session? You know, by the time you get to trial or arbitration, we've usually lived with facts for a long time. We are so familiar with our side. We're so familiar with why we're right. We have to remember as advocates that it's important to step out of our side and really think about the strengths and, of course, the weaknesses of the side that's going to be against us. That's a difficult thing for an advocate to do because we can really convince ourselves that we, our side is the only way. But before you walk into a courtroom or a hearing room, it's essential that you've washed yourself in the other side's argument, thought about what their strengths are, and figured out how the fact finder is going to hear those strengths and how you can persuade them that those strengths are not going to hurt your side. In the courtroom, the advocate's not always the one making the rules about whether you can stand or sit or require to stay by a lectern. Those are rules that it's important for the advocate to find out before your trial starts. And it's important to think about strategically what's the best way to deliver your information. It can be a challenge to direct or cross-examine a witness from a sitting position in any effective way. Something that the advocates need to think about and prepare as part of their preparation for the trial. And if you get a chance, go to the courtroom before before you need to be there. Check to see the layout. Find out where you're going to display things. If you're going to use PowerPoint, find out where the outlets are for your computer or your projector. Find out where's the best place to stand so that you're not in the way of other counsel, the judge, or the jury as they look at the exhibits that you hope to show. You know, the advocate in an arbitration hearing really needs to know what the stage is going to look like, how big the hearing room is, whether they're going to have to stand or sit, whether it feels right to stand or sit uh, when they're doing their examinations, their opening, their closing. Uh, they also, and one way you find this out, is visit the hearing room before the hearing, days before the hearing, and also talk to the arbitrators about what the arbitrator wants and uh, what the custom is in the arbitration hearing. Another thing to consider is the size of the room and how we're going to use exhibits. Since it's often much smaller than a courtroom, you don't need to use PowerPoint or some big presentation. Oftentimes you can get away with using just small blow-ups of the exhibits and hand them out to the arbitrator and let them review them personally right in front of them. Edit edit, edit. Your case is too long. You've got too many facts. You know this case better than anyone, but you don't have to put everything you know in front of the fact finder. More and more attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. No one says, I wanted to hear more from the advocate. I wanted more questions. I wanted this to last longer and longer. Find the facts that are persuasive in your case. Highlight those facts. Edit, edit, edit. So, Hassan, next time you put it up, you think you can get the, uh, the speakers to show movement? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll see. All right. Well, I, that's, I mean, they are just restating what I said, but these, 
are really fine trial lawyers and they are doing a lot of work in arbitrations, which is to me very much like the court trials that you have in front of experienced professional judges. Uh, and again, I look back at my opening speeches that were went on too long, way too much detail. And I would agree with the judge, you might as well not have had me there at all because I was so awful. But can I take, can I take and make an opening statement so the judge can see it from my viewpoint? Uh, well, do you have any comments at all before we show the first segment? You're muted. Um, I think you were gonna, um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve um, talking about opening statements maybe till after we watch the final argument piece, right? Right. Yeah. So what I'm gonna suggest now is uh, when we get this, our presentation, we're gonna go back to our case file and with the whole group, try to figure out how we're gonna plan this. So uh, we have a general statement on final argument and I, we're doing final argument first because as I said before, if you don't know where you're going, any road is gonna get you there. And so your opening speech is supposed to give you a roadmap of where you're gonna go. But if you don't understand where you're going, then who cares? I never understood that. And nobody explained that to me. So I would prepare my opening speech with no idea what I was gonna do in final argument. And I've heard our students say, well, I don't know what the evidence is going to be. So how can I prepare my final argument? I think you can all give a final argument on a case even with the bare bones of facts. You may want to have to, you'll have to fill in the details, but you do know what you're gonna argue. If you don't know what you're arguing, particularly prosecution, if you don't know what you're gonna argue, how can you possibly go forward? And the defense knows almost immediately what they're gonna say and how you can challenge the other side. So let's look at final argument first. Then we'll go back and look at a presentation on opening speeches. They're not very long. Uh, Hassan, can you put it up? Yep. All the skills we've been talking about, the skills of direct and cross-examination, the skills of opening statement apply to closing argument as well. The preparation of the closing argument begins as soon as the case comes into your office. We must practice that closing argument well in advance, talk it, work it, structure it, because if we don't know what the closing argument is going to be, if we don't have a goal, we don't have a place where we're going, we will not be able to have good discovery, we will not be able to prepare a good direct examination, we will not be able to prepare an effective cross-examination. Closing argument is not a rehash of the case. It's not a rehash of the evidence. It's not a rehash of who said what about whom to when. It has to have the same structure. It must be parallel. It must be parallel to the opening statement. It must give the fact finder hooks, evidentiary, legal, theory, and theme hooks upon which they can hang the evidence. The fact finder should be able to understand it easily and simply and walk out of that room and understand your position. Since most advocates are not organized, since most advocates are not parallel in their construction, the advocate who makes it easy, the advocate who makes it clear and structured, will have a better opportunity to be successful. In this final argument, remember we're not giving a speech to 500 people. We're talking in a very intimate setting six or seven feet. The room is only as big as the persons you're talking to. Each juror is an individual and sees himself or herself as a one. No group of people in a room think they're a group, they are ones. And when we're talking to a judge or an arbitrator, you're talking to a human being who needs to be brought into the room. So when you're talking to that arbitrator or that judge and you say, judge, Judge Brown, Arbitrator, Arbitrator Brown, we have proved that, or Arbitrator Brown, the employee in this case must be suspended. The evidence and the facts and the witnesses demonstrate that the decision of the company to suspend the employee is appropriate, or members of this jury Members of the jury, 
the defendant designed a defective SUV. And that SUV rolled over in ordinary driving conditions. And we demonstrated that cause. You see what we've done? We've done the same parallel as we did in the opening statement. Look at the structure of the opening statement. Take the same structure. Take the same structure of your opening statement. And when you talk about damages, don't use that word. The person is not the person they once were. The lifestyle has changed. They've lost financials, and here's where it is. But more importantly, the quality of life. What is it worth? What is it worth to not have a leg? What is it worth to be a vibrant person and no longer able to do it? Or in an arbitration? What is it worth? What is it worth when a company makes a decision to terminate somebody without just cause? What is that worth? It's worth reinstatement right here, right now, today. If you as an advocate practice your final arguments way in advance, there will be no stress. You'll be able to do it. You will know it. You will have a structure and the listeners will be able to understand it. The listeners will be able to make a decision based on what you say. They will not, like Cicero said, be able to reason matters through without your help. Because everything you have done has been calculated to win, to influence, and to persuade. Now let's look at the two final arguments with our panel. Now, of course, what the panel is going to be seeing is um, a labor arbitration. And we can make that available to you if you want to see it for free and watch it, uh, if you want to look on your own. I think we can do that, Hassan. Uh, we have the entire file, which I have, and we'll just uh, make it available to everybody if you wish. You can decide if you want to do it. But again, there's a discussion of the techniques, not the law on labor arbitration, but on the techniques of doing direct and cross-examination, opening speeches, etc. So now, if you accept that we should prepare the final argument in advance and we should practice it. And what I mean by that is uh, don't write it out. Uh, I, that's how I started. I wrote out all the words and I read what I wrote, uh, both on openings and closings. I don't write plays well. I don't write good movie scripts. I always wondered when they spend $10 million on a movie, why some of the dialogue is so horrible. And why do some of the great writers write dialogue that makes sense and is so simple? So what I do is I try to be myself. I practice and I practice all the time. Now, not with my wife, who's in another room right now, who drive her crazy. But when I'm going for a walk or I'm doing the dishes or scrubbing the floor, I'm talking all the time, practicing. And with, with having the earbuds in, um, you can pretend you're talking on your telephone. Uh, that's a great tool. The people think that you're talking on your phone. Uh, before we had earbuds and cell phones, you'd probably get locked up because you people would think you're talking to someone up in the sky. But now we can have incredible conversations and say the most incredible things while we're practicing our opening speeches and our final arguments. So we know what we're going to argue. We'll look at the cartel case and figure out what are we going to argue in this case? How can we do it in advance? But since I know where I'm going, now let's go back and look at my short little presentation on opening speeches. And then Willow has prepared a short paper that we can take through and think about opening speeches. I think, uh, contrary to other people, I think opening statements are really, really important because it sets the tone. And how in the world in Britain are you able to present your case from the defense, particularly your cross-examination, if the other side, the judge doesn't know where you're going. And we'll see it from the filter of the opening speech for the prosecution and the direct examination. So you are not balanced. They're ahead of you. And in some countries, the direct examination is submitted to the judge in paper prepared by the lawyers. And in Singapore, I worked on two divorce cases in which we wrote the direct examination for the witnesses. And then the other side's cross-examination. So you, the, the, the 
fact finder never ever heard the witness from the perspective of a presentation through that witness's eyes. So in the culture, we have to figure out how to use it in the settings that we're in. So let's look at the setting of sound on uh, the opening speech. It's another very short setup. John, before you start, I would like to give some, give some short explanation to our participants about what the opening sp uh, speech and final argument stands for in Turkish law. So in Turkish criminal procedure law 216 makes a ruling that uh, the parties are asked, the prosecutor, defense lawyer, etc., about their opinion after the presentation of each evidence, each piece of evidence. And this is the first time when a defense lawyer com comes to talk. And at this point, this is considered as an opening speech for us. But at the end of all uh, evidence has been produced. And then there's a final argument, which is called in Turkish by the word esas hakkında mütala. And this is the final argument. So uh, the participants must be, be aware of this difference. In Turkey, we don't have a clear set opening speech, but it is embedded in the procedure that you have the chance to talk as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer. But the final argument is, set, is regulated in Turkish criminal procedure. So, and by the way, we have another meeting going on about the future of the legal education. And today's presenter, before I joined this room was about uh, persuading uh, uh, argument, per persuasing, persuasing speech. And I urge uh, all our participants to see this through internet and also to join your talk tomorrow. You are going to talk tomorrow in this uh, seminar, in this transnational issue. And we are going to send to all of the participants the Zoom link that they can at attend your meeting as well. So now, Hassan, you, you can go on. Before we do, uh, again, from the very beginning, we talked about the different processes in different jurisdictions and different cultures. So we as lawyers have to work the culture within the culture that we have. In our country, that we are allowed to give an opening speech and a, a closing speech. In our country, the prosecution goes first in the opening speech. The defense goes second. In final argument, there's, more, there's differences. In some states, the defense goes first and the prosecution goes second. In the federal government and in some states, the prosecution goes first, followed by the defense and the prosecution has a rebuttal at the end. So the placement of your argument in the structure is really important to understand what you're gonna say, because if you're going first, you've got to anticipate what the other side is going to say about your case. So, and, uh, so let's look at the, the uh, opening statement, Hassan. Opening statements are the first time the advocate is permitted to forcefully make a presentation to the fact finder. <laughs> While the opening statement is not supposed to be argument, it must be positive, it must be forceful, it must be simple, and it must be persuasive. Now, an opening statement can begin with an introduction or a setup that sets the scene. It does not have to be long, but it establishes a framework. Following that, a small table of contents to tell the fact finder where the advocate is going. A second table of contents or a more detailed table of contents can describe what is going to happen in more detail, just like a good textbook would have a detailed table of contents following the outline table of contents. After that, there's the story or what happened. The advocate can say, now let me tell you what happened. And if there is a good table of contents, what the advocate says fits into the context. And at the end, we can come back to the beginning that sets the framework and the focus for the entire presentation. Most advocates will sit down and write out their opening statement and final argument. 
Not one of us, not one of us is a good enough playwright to write a brilliant piece of acting, a brilliant piece of theater. When we get up and memorize something, it is not us. So I suggest to you that you outline your opening statements. You outline your final arguments. You practice it in chunks as you drive, as you work out, as you fold clothes and wash dishes and walk the dog. Practice every single day so it isn't memorized information, it's known information. You know it. And if you practice it in chunks, you can move it around. And if you get to a place that you need to write something down because you can't get it right, all you have to say is, as I was practicing this opening statement, or this final argument. I wrote down this piece of information because I couldn't get it the way I wanted to get it. And you can read that portion of your opening statement or your final argument to the fact finder. And then go back to being yourself because the most important thing is we are the most important we's that we can be. We cannot be someone else. We can build on other people's skills. We can build on other people's ideas. We can steal. We can try things out till they become our own. But what the fact finder has to see is a real person making a real presentation. We do not have the time. We just don't have the time to memorize our script. We don't have the time to be someone else. But we do have the time to practice. And we do have the time to be ourselves. And we do have the time to develop our own skills and we do have the time to become more effective advocates. So as we practice, um, I do think a lot about, I watch a lot of film, I watch a lot of politicians, I watch how they do things. And uh, yesterday we've had some hearings on a former president of ours and a couple of the speakers did a real nice job. In fact, one of them was a prosecutor or defense lawyer for 18 years. And you can see in his delivery, of course, some of the presenters were just horrible because they were unstructured, unfocused in the criticisms in the paper about what this defense lawyer for President, former President Trump said, was they just mocked him. So we don't want to be mocked. We don't want the judge to say, oh, something was just horrible. What an awful person. I don't believe his case. I don't understand it. I don't like him. I wish he'd go home. We don't want that to happen, do we? So, Willow, do you want to put up that short paper that you put and talk it through? Yeah, yeah. First, first, uh, before we put the paper up, I'd just like to say that opening statements are one of my favorite parts of being a lawyer. Um, and to kind of set the scene for you, and, and maybe many of you have experienced this, most cases don't ever go to trial. And so you spend a lot of time working on cases, working on cases. And by the time you're able to do an opening statement in a case, uh, as the speaker said in the video, you've lived with these facts and with this client for a very long time. And generally what happens uh, in, a, in a courtroom in the United States is you don't know exactly when you're going to start because there's all these behind the scenes motions that are happening, legal motions with the court and opposing counsel and deals. And you think it's gonna settle and you think it's gonna settle, but then it doesn't. And then you have another motion in front of the court and the judge and the judge reprimands you and reprimands the other side. And there's incredible amount of stress. You've just chosen a jury. And all of a sudden, when it's time to give the opening statement, it's like the calm before the storm and you can take a deep breath and you go, okay, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Like this is what I'm doing this for. And you're sitting at counsel table, you've passed the bar. So you're, you're, you're sitting not in the gallery but you're sitting up at counsel table and you watch those jurors file in one by one. And, and you see like, oh, it's real people. Um, and in the case of a judge, it's the same thing, but there's this profound difference when you start uh, to begin your case. And um, what I was always taught and what I, what I remember when I'm ready to give my opening statement is we stand up, we stand right before the jury, 
not too close, not too far, but this is our first chance to really talk to them. And so what I do is I take a deep breath and I look everybody in the eye and I don't start talking until there's silence and until I have their attention. And I had an incredible speech coach once that gave me this advice. He said, before you open your mouth, in your mind, you think to yourself, I have something really important to tell you. And I think that to myself, and then I begin my opening statement. Um, I put together just some notes um, because I've given this presentation to other criminal defense attorneys in the United States. I've been practicing law and litigating for almost 20 years. About half of the time I was working for the government prosecuting and about half of the time I've worked on the defense side. And so um, I, have, I, I like them both. I think being a prosecutor is um, really important work um, and has its own challenges. But um, being on the defense side as a lawyer to me is more challenging. You're able to use your creativity more. Um, with being a prosecutor, oftentimes it was a numbers game. We were trying to get through as many cases uh, as we could just because there weren't the resources to really focus on, um, on, on making each case count. On the private side, there's more risk, there's more uncertainty, um, the cards are stacked against you. There's no question that the cards are in favor of the government, no matter how many try things we try to put in place, um, the, the government uh, has, has an advantage. So when you're working for a criminal defendant, um, you're really working for the underdog. And so I, I enjoy that piece of it. Um, so the, the notes that I put together, um, Hassan, if, if you want to put those up, um, these were really geared more towards um, a criminal defense group, but that said, it's, um, it's really equally the same for both of them. Um, Professor Sonstang, he says, this is not a story, and I fully agree with this. Um, John Quincy Adams, a great jurist, said in a courtroom, whoever tells the best story wins. Um, it's not a story, but it is something very important that you need to convey. Um, and Hassan, you can just kind of... Um, um, just kind of th scroll through this because we can just go through this very quickly. I mean, here's the point of an opening statement is it lets you explain the evidence. It allows you to tell a compelling story. It's your opportunity to highlight your good facts and downplay your bad facts, maybe to introduce your bad facts so they hear them coming from you. Um, but ultimately, it's providing a lens for your what you're trying to portray. Um, in a defense case, I, I, the defense is, um, you know, we talk a lot about burdens, attorneys do, um, that, you know, it's the state's burden of proof. And my experience is that if this is going to be your theory, you're going to lose. Although that's what the law requires. The law requires that the state needs to prove. Have we lost her? Have we lost uh, Willow? I think she has a connection problem at the moment, Professor. All right. Well, we'll hope she gets back again. <laughs> um, oh, she, well, she will, because um, Hassan is a genius. <laughs> and we'll do this. Um, Willow is a marvelous trial lawyer and a superb teacher. Um, she's one of our top teachers in our advocacy courses. Um, so one of the places we'll start, just like she says, is what I'm, I'm trying to do. And let's look at our cartel case. You're going to have to sort of suspend your imagination a bit. Have, if, um, if you've read it and have some idea, then I'd like you to get engaged with us as we talk about it. But what do you think some ideas about the, the prosecution would say about what they're going to prove and why. Anybody got any ideas? Mustafa, Mehmet, anyone? Or haven't you read it? May I ask something? Uh, to yes. Dr. Yensei? Yes, yes, please, go ahead. 
Uh, sir, I have resembled the opening speech to the bill of uh, indictment in Turkish law. I think opening speech uh, is similar to reading allegation. İddianamenin ilk duruşmada okunması hocam. Uh, to reading allegation paper in the first trial. Am I wrong? Is that similar? I think it's similar because in Turkish law, the indictment will be told to the suspects and it's a kind of explanation about the case what's going on it should be in detail the allegations should be told to the suspect or accused in detail but the opening speech really doesn't exist as a institution in turkish law where it's, it's, it exists in us so therefore you can replace it by after the evidence each evidence is produced you can take the floor and talk about the evidence and the cases but professor sonstein told us that it should be connected to your closing argument you have repeat the same ideas in the closing ideas but uh, john uh, maybe it's wise to tell the facts of the cartel case again that uh, I'll, you can I'll do that. would you do it Yep. Look, I want to, um, uh, is it Ramazan, is that correct? The pronounce your name? Ramazan? Yes, I understand. Thank you. Yes. But in, in your case, if you have the evidence by the, let's say the police officer who was called first, you could describe his evidence by saying, based on what the officer said, we have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that cartel committed the crime of burglary, robbery, assault, and theft. You could say he entered a house of the victim without permission. He took items from her house. The items, some of the items were found in his car. His description matched of the, of the robber matched cartel. And in cartel's apartment, we found items that identified with the person who robbed the house. I mean, I can comment, but I'm giving a little opening statement, but I'm summarizing what the officer said in case the judge may not have been listening or seeing it through my perspective. So let's talk about this case. And you'll, again, you'll have to use your imagination. Um, the defendant in this case, John Paul Cartel, uh, is the son of a fishing, uh, a shipping magnate from Istanbul. Now I had some fun with it, uh, never thinking I would be back here in front of you talking about Cartel. He came over to the US in the place we have titled Mid-State, because we didn't want to name a state, a Mid-State, uh, to study at the university and talk, uh, talk about veterinary medicine. Uh, he called it animal husbandry. He, uh, you think of the climate we have and our border walls and all the things that are going on here. He was someone the officer had an eye on because he was from, not from our country. The police do have that, that kind of attitude. Uh, the officer wanted to get someone. So on the night of the incident, the victim come, came home from the theater, saw that her door was open, walked up to her door, and a man rushed out, knocking her aside. Items were taken from her house. She saw him for a brief second. He was wearing a bandana, a scarf covering from his nose down. It was uh, a red bandana. Uh, he was wearing a, we, if you see pictures of American young people, they're all wearing baseball caps. And uh, he was wearing a baseball cap. You know, I hope you know what that means. But on it, it had a strange logo, which was called the eel pouts. Now an eel pout is a, weird fish that lives in our northern lakes. And, and in this, now you, you would never imagine that in, in your country, but it, there's a sports team named the Eel Pouts. And those hats are so stupid that they have been selling like crazy. Everybody wants to have an Eel Pout hat. And you'll see in the evidence, if you look at it, how many Eel Pout hats have been sold. Now, the victim is, is able to describe the height, the height and size of the person who robbed her. We have a robbery. 
looking at the statute, it says whoever enters a building without the permission of the person in lawful possession and commits a crime inside the building is guilty of burglary. Whoever assaults a person with a dangerous weapon, he's accusing the man of assaulting her with a stick, a baseball bat, could be a rug, uh, um, cricket bat too, but assault someone with that. So he assaulted her, he took stuff from her, theft, robbery, assault, those are the items. There's no doubt that this woman was robbed her house was burglarized and she was assaulted. She is able to look at the car. It's a blue car. It is parked on the right-hand side of the street. <clears throat> it has some rust spots on its door. And the officer recognizes this car as one that he's seen John Paul Cartel driving. So he goes to John Paul Cars, Cartel's house gets permission from John Paul to go in the house, gets permission. He sees the car outside, cartel meets him. He says, can I come down with you into your room? He goes in the room, he sees a bandana, he sees the eel pout hat. He looks in the window of the car outside and he sees an item that he identifies, the officer does, as belonging to the victim of the crime. Now cartel doesn't say anything, he doesn't have to, he's given his warnings, he doesn't speak, he has an excuse later on, he describes it as the car, he lent the car to someone else, a mystery person, um, and his claim is he has no alibi because he was home alone. Uh, he has no idea who took it, he has no idea who used his car, he did, was done so without his permission. Um, so I mean, that, that, there's the case, very simple. So Willow's back, well, we lost you there. Do you want to pick up again from where you were back on your opening speech? Are you there? Sorry there you about are. that. I don't know what right. happened. My internet kicked me off. Sorry. So you, we, um, we've, we've talked about the case, the cartel case. All right. Uh -huh. all okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. We, we were just kind of going through some of the basics about the purpose of an opening statement. Um, and and one thing that um, I learned in law school from Professor Sansting, and as I continue to study trial skills is, as you think of a theme of the case, you're thinking about the legal theme of the case that's required that you need to prove, but you also need to think about the persuasive theme of the case. Um, so your theory of the case, both legally, but also what sticks, what, what persuades people? What viscerally do they understand and can they believe? Um, and once you do that, if you create an organizational structure that includes your theory of the case, both factually, legally, and what's persuasive, um, then, you can, then you can begin working backwards from your closing argument and then reverse engineering it into an opening statement. Um, do you want me to do an example? Sure, yes, please. Um, so after I uh, have the privilege of standing up in front of a jury and taking a deep breath, um, a lot of lawyers will start with something like, members of the jury, <laughs> or may it please the court. And I've found that what we, know about persuasion is that the first thing you say and the last thing you say are are are the things that that people remember whether it's judges or juries so i don't like to waste my first few lines on members of the jury i'd like to introduce myself isn't it a lovely day and i'm so glad you could all be here and do your patriotic duty you've just wasted your your precious 30 seconds or one minute so I might start with something like, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He should have left earlier. He shouldn't have offered his friend a ride. It was three in the morning. He was tired. He just wanted to go home. And then it happened. It happened, it's true. Mr. Smith died, he was murdered but he didn't do it. My client didn't do it. My client didn't do it. Let me tell you a little bit about my client. 
Let me tell you about Mr. Cruz. And then you can go in and introduce who your client is. And then somewhere in the middle, you can say, members of the jury, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. And it's my privilege. My name is Willow Anderson, Willow Najar Anderson. And it's my privilege to be standing up for Mr. Cruz today. And I'm here to show you, he didn't do it. They got the wrong guy. Simple, it's simple. And of course you fill it in. I mean, a, a opening like that might take more like 40 minutes, not one minute, but you get the gist of it. That's the beginning and that's the end. So Hassan, do you wanna put up your the, the, the paper? So in this case, I'm saying, okay, it happened and I was there, but it wasn't me. <laughs> um, requirements of the theory of the case, it needs to highlight your good facts. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, Hassan, just keep scrolling it through. The theme of your case, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. These are just things that, um, you know, if we had more time, these are just from, from movies that I kind of started thinking of uh, what the theme of those movies were. A lot of times we can use those in, in trials. Um, and then, you know, keep it short, keep it simple, keep it understandable, stay organized. This is your time to establish trust with the jury. Uh, you want them to look to you for the answers. Um, for most of the hearing or the trial, you won't be looking them in the eye, you'll be examining witnesses. So this is your chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with the jury. And so you don't wanna waste your time sounding like a lawyer. I mean, in, in the United States, a common phrase that people overuse in opening statements is, the evidence will show, the evidence will show, the evidence will show. And I did that plenty of times as a prosecutor, but you know, it gets, it, it gets a little redundant. Um, and the most important thing is don't over promise what you can't deliver. So don't promise something in the opening statement that you don't know for sure will be proven. Because if you don't, the one thing the jury remembers is she said it was a red light, but they proved it was a green light. And therefore everything she's saying must be a lie. Introduce your client to the jury, explain who he or she is. This is so important. Um, and this is one of the fun parts of being a criminal defense attorney uh, that, I, that I like a lot is that this is human. This is a human experience. Um, it's, it's the reason you know Zoom can be challenging in, in the world of, of trials these days. Um, but as a criminal defense attorney, this is one of the most important things that you do is, is humanize your client. I like to be the one to bring out the bad facts. I would much rather be the one to have them come through my mouth rather than how it, it comes from the other side. Same with the law. Um, it's important to talk about the presumption of innocence in, in our country and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but I don't exclusively rely on that. Um, visual presentations are so, are so important. Um, what you say, how you say it, how you stand, make sure to use your gestures. These things get long, so we wanna keep everybody awake, keeping eye contact, stay nimble, be flexible, wait for your opponent. Oh, we lose you again. Know where you're going to end. Oh no. Oh. Okay. Oh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> the end. End big. <laughs> end big. Uh, what I was thinking about is, as well, I was talking, you know, we're talking about jurors, but we also are talking about arbitrators. And now, if I were in Turkey and I wasn't allowed to give an opening statement, but I could give something out in the after my witness is testified, I think that's correct, after the witness is testified, and suppose I called my first witness and it is John Paul Cartel, I wanna call him. Where would I start? Do I ask about his background, what his father does? Or I would say, or would I say, Mr. Cartel, now do I have to ask him what his name is? 
No, because you say, Your Honor, our first witness is John Paul Cartel. And I'm ready to go. Our first witness is Officer X. Um, last name Jones, Officer Jones, and spelled J O Y N E S. But what do we think? What would be your first question if you didn't have an opening speech? What, what's the most important thing? What would you say to someone across the table from you? What's the most important thing? Somebody, raise your hand. What's the most important thing? Anybody? I've never heard it before where someone in Turkey didn't talk. That was a joke. Anybody? Maybe that he didn't do it. Like, yeah. I mean, it's that's, a... it. that's yes. And so my question to John Paul Cartel is, Mr. Cartel, did you do it? No. Do you know who did? No. Have you ever met her before the victim? No. Have you ever been to her house? No. All right. Where were you? And now I'll come back to his house. I mean, you can, isn't that what everybody wants to know? I mean, I think about my family who tell these stories um, and go on and on and on. And you just want to, I don't know if anybody here has relatives like that, but the simplest story goes on and on and on. Or someone tells a joke and they talk so long, you never get the point and you want to walk away. But somebody else can do the same story or same joke and you get it just like that. It's exciting. So as advocates, particularly with judges who are doing it all the time. They have so much going on. I've been in some of the courtrooms in Turkey and they're just really busy. And they've got all sorts of things. And who knows if the judge doesn't have a sore knee or the judge's dog died that morning or the judge had a fight with the spouse. I mean, and is distracted. How do you bring him in? How do you tell him? How do you make it simple? So my thing is now what is the other side from the government going to say? The evidence showed that it was John Paul Cartel who did it. We proved it beyond a reasonable doubt or we're going to prove it and here's why. I mean, I, I just simply have to be more straightforward uh, and just very obvious about this stuff. So let's, does that make sense to you? Then why not ask him and say, did you do it? And how come, and of course, if somebody has an alibi, that's a pretty good excuse to show that he did it because most people don't have alibis at night because most people are home alone. Most people, a lot of people are home alone. You don't line up witnesses to cover yourself at three in the morning. So anybody have any ideas? What are the strengths in this case for the government? That's how I'm gonna look at each case. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Can anybody talk about the strengths in the case? Anybody? Am I, am I thinking that most people haven't had a chance to read this? I actually uh, emphasize, uh, yes. sorry, uh, hi. Uh, uh, I emphasize the uh, search warrant, uh, search warrant uh, detail in the case. Uh, in uh, our criminal uh, law system, uh, the search warrant for entering the house uh, is uh, only taken by the court or judge or uh, prosecutors, not the police officials. In the cartel case, uh, the police officers uh, have had entered the uh, house without any search warrant. Uh, it leads us the, uh, the materials the police officials uh, took the house uh, cannot be used uh, in the trial or prosecution in according to our uh, Turkish uh, criminal law system. I don't know uh, the uh, America's uh, system, uh, how it works, but uh, that's what it is in uh, Turkey. And I, think, yeah, in Turkey, I think you'd be correct. But in, in this case, the, if we say that cartel gave permission then the officer could enter if he gave voluntary uh, permission to enter the house. Uh, Faridin, did he, is that rule apply there? In Turkey, the ruling is even though the uh, owner of the house gives permission, police are not entitled to get in and make a search without a warrant. And this is, uh, has some historical background in Turkey. 
and Turkish law is very strict in this sense. And the High Court ruled several times that every piece of evidence should be excluded if there is no warrant. In the U.S., they'd have to be warned unless they had permission. And the rule would be, was it freely and voluntary given? Was the uh, permission uh, uh, free and voluntary? So in our country, it would be free and voluntary. So the mask and the bandana and the um, hat would be admissible. In Turkey, it wouldn't be. Is that correct? Yes. Siba? But you know, this case would be a good example for if the case would be handled in Turkey. Yes. Would Turkish courts take this evidence or not? In the homeland where the search was done, it is legal. But in Turkey, it is not legal. So what? how do you rule about illegally obtained evidence abroad? So uh, this is a big problem uh, to be discussed in Turkey. It, it's an important difference. In, in England, if the search was illegal, yet the evidence was relevant, it would come in. It would be admissible. In the US, in, in the US even though it's relevant, if the search was illegal, the evidence wouldn't come in. So we have to find a reason in the US why the search, the entry into the house was legal. And the position of the prosecution would be if the officer entered the house with the free and voluntary permission of cartel. If the landlady gave permission to search his room, that would not be sufficient because she doesn't have the right to give permission to search cartel's room. But cartel does in our country. So the in our country, the mask and the a mask, the, the bandana and the hat are admissible. Those are key pieces of evidence. So in your country, the defense has quite a bit more to talk about because they can't, that's not admissible to in um, in the court. So I think that's an interesting strategic plan. When we try the case at the end, I'll try it both ways. All right. And we'll we'll assume for the we'll assume it's in Turkey, it's not admissible. We'll assume the, in, with the US jury that it is, so we can compare the results. But the pieces found in the car are admissible for Turkish law because it's open view yep. and officer could see through. It's not a search in a real sense. So those are per admitted, but not the other ones which are found at home. Right. So the, and this, that's the same in our country. We call it the plain view doctrine. The officer has the right to seize things that he sees in plain view at a place that the officer has the right to be. So if the car's on the open street and he can see in the window, the officer can seize what he sees. Mm -hmm. Could not conduct a search just uh, if just if he didn't see anything, he couldn't conduct a search. I don't in our country without a search warrant. All right, anything more? How about the identification procedure? Anyone? Well, under Turkish law, there must be a glass between the uh, person who identifies and the other persons. In this case, this was not the case. And she was shown one person and the identification is illegal under Turkish law. So if she picks him out in the courtroom, Faridun, and she had seen him in the identification array, uh, would that influence the in-court identification? <clears throat> but the first identification was done on the street or on somewhere where yeah. it's not properly. Even though she identifies him in the courtroom, this would be not permitted under Turkish law. So the courtroom identification would be poisoned by the uh, improper identification beforehand. Well, uh, this is my uh, explanation, but I don't know what the court would do. Maybe the court would take the courtroom ad identification. I'm not sure about it. Uh, I think, is it possible? It is possible the court identification in the courtroom, because as our and uh, Professor Yenisei said, said, and before the or uh, while. Uh, going on, ongoing investigation, the police has an opportunity to make an identification with the complaint. So, and after that, and we have the uh, opportunity to 
and identified in the courtroom. And you by know. the way, and if I were a prosecutor, I would ask as a first question to a defender side, is there a, host hostel a hostility between you and complaint? Mm -hmm. I would ask. In, in our country, to have the courtroom identification be ad admissible, if the original identification was improper, you have to show that the identification in the courtroom was an independent identification that was not influenced by the pre-court improper identification. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the rule works in Turkey. Ferdinand? Well, I, I would suggest the same for Turkish law, but I don't know any example of court decision in Turkey where uh, first identification was illegal and the second, uh, it didn't occur now until now in Turkish jurisprudence as far as I know. And is, is, are your rules based on statutory rules developed by the, by the government? Yes, we have statutory rule, but the high court may give some explanations about the application of a statute. And this, uh, these decisions are also uh, valuable for the judge. Judge takes it uh, by his decision, but cannot go beyond the borders of the law. It must be just a reasoning problem or explanation, but not making a new rule by making a reasoning. In, the, in, in Britain, the rules are all statutory. Uh, they had common law rules, but now they have, it's all statutory. In the US, remember we have 50 states plus the federal government, 50 different sets of rules and statutes saying what is criminal and not criminal. We have state Supreme Courts, state Supreme Courts that are ruling on these rules. And then the US Supreme Court makes rules on the game, may govern Minnesota, but doesn't, a Minnesota case, but name may not apply to Florida, for example although they try to rule in a way that covers it, it across the country. And so we have this ever-changing sets of rules um, uh, on, on admissibility of evidence. Uh, I'll just give you the, the warnings, the Miranda warnings, which was the right to not talk to the police. That all changed in the 1960s. It was very dramatic, the changes. And that's the first time it applied nationally to everyone in the 1960s, which in terms of criminal justice, that's not very long ago. Ferdin, any other, or Willow, any comments? Well, as far as Miranda warnings are concerned, Turkish law requires that at the first apprehension, the police must give the suspect the right of silence and also the right to have an attorney. But if they don't do it, then the whole procedure is poisoned. And we have a case, Saldus, against Turkey from European Court of Human Rights. And it's very strict on this. So all the confessions are not valid if there is no lawyer. And it is a method of illegally uh, obtained evidence if there is no lawyer in, in the case of uh, questioning by the police. If the uh, lawyer is not present while questioning, he can always deny what he said and he can get through of it. I think your rules are much more structured than ours, much more organized. I think I know a person who was involved in it. I, I think he's sitting in the upper left-hand corner of my screen. In our country, the rules are so in flux all the time Right now we have a, a Supreme Court that's changed dramatically over the last four years. And we're looking at how those rules will change because of the makeup of the court. And your country, which is statutory uh, with interpretation by the court, but the statutory rules are really good, really organized. Um, does anybody have any other comments about planning it? If we're thinking about this, we know what we have to do, then how do we go forward planning our case? I mean, I. I will always set up the thing if I, if I have a jury, but if I have a judge, what am I gonna do in my, in my case to make it be persuasive? How am I gonna organize my direct and cross-examination? How am I gonna or organize my final speech? How am I gonna do it? 
and each of us, each of us is going to have to be different. So I'd like you to think about yourself. And uh, maybe you don't want to talk, but perhaps if you did, we'd have some exchange of ideas. Phyllis, any thoughts? Unmute. Okay. No, but I was listening and I promise to be ready to engage more. You are right. It, it is important to have discussion. And one of, as we know, one of the great challenges, I say to all the other participants, one of the great challenges is how does one make the environment uh, comfortable enough that all of you, like me, are willing to participate in the discussion. So I will try and I hope the many people, some of whom I have seen quite a few, I have seen their names in the past. Uh, I hope that many will speak up also because you are right, Professor. More discussion is more interesting and more learning comes from it. And by the way, after our five weeks are, is over. Phyllis Cox is going to continue with uh, advanced legal English class with this group. If you are interested, you may stay in after five weeks and continue with her in advanced legal English course. And by then we will be very interactive. I, hope so. <laughs> I look forward to this time with Professor Sangsten and the time after. Yeah, that's, we have some chats here. I feel more comfortable um, uh, on chats. Um, I think it's uh, Zoom is very difficult. I think when we next week, I hope to have a judge from Seattle who's doing lots of Zoom trials and actually Zoom jury trials and has developed a protocol at Seattle, Washington, which is the upper left northwest corner of our country on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, very good teacher. I've talked to him yesterday. He would like to participate. But how we use this Zoom methods of teaching, it, it's, I think it's really hard. So you have a Zoom trial. Are you doing Zoom trials in Turkey? In, in civil proceedings, we do, but not in criminal trials. But in criminal trials, we have a principle that is called SIG, SEGBIS, which stands for audiovisual transmission of image. And there, there's a live transmission of some interactions like witness hearings and suspect interrogation can be done partially though, not the whole procedure. But in civil courts, they do now, there's a new ruling since this year. And the civil courts may do a whole hearing online. And so, but in a criminal case, the defendant would have to appear in court. Is that correct? This is the principle, but in exceptional cases, we may have him uh, join the courtroom by video recording, not recording, video and uh, at the same time. So he must be present uh, via internet, but it is not recorded. Life, he is live like we are now. And where would the lawyer wouldn't have to be in the room? The lawyer could be somewhere else, right? Uh, this is the discussion. So there is no rule about this, but there are some court decisions which say that the court, the judge, uh, no, the suspect and the lawyer must be in the same room. And this is the fair trial principle if they are in the same room. All right, well, I think that. Uh... We're moving more towards uh, online trials, but right now we have the same requirement for in-person jury trials. But we are experimenting in the class that Willow and I teach. We are having Zoom jury trials, and we're going to do a Zoom criminal one to test it out to see how it works. But I think we're not going to get as much discussion as I'd hoped for. So I am going to go on uh, to start talking about direct and cross-examination. Is that OK with you, Faridan? Yes, yes. Uh, we're, we're about um, 40 minutes ahead of where I thought we would be because I thought uh, Mustafa and Mehmet and Adam and Zera would all and Akun, Akin would all be talking 
vigorously, uh, but uh, I see not. Um, so there's some uh, good comments in the chat there. Why don't you respond some to some ideas? Well, um, Sarah Ramsey cannot identify the suspect that she encountered, if that was the case. You're talking about the admissibility of evidence. Can you see those? The stolen objects could not be found within the premises of cartel. They were, I mean, these are great arguments and these could come out in opening. They were in line and she thinks that Mr. Cartel was the one which can be translated that she's not fully sure. Another question, we can ask how Mr. Cartel explains the evidence found in his house. How did they find it in the first place? Those are all, I think those are, those are, that's great development of the theory of the case. Yeah, Sarah cannot, she can, she, the, the, the John Park, Paul Cartel looks like this person, the same body build, but she didn't see his face below his nose. Uh, and, and, and his hair was covered. So her identification standing alone would not be enough. But there's other circumstantial evidence, which is what? The mask and hat were found in his room, but they may not be admissible. That the ev some evidence was found in his car, which is admissible, but it's not in his room, but in his car. And he has a reasonable explanation of why that might be in his car. The, the uh, other person, the dis there's a person, I think his name is Harry, is uh, not there. It's a mysterious person who might have been driving the car. Nobody can find him. So that person can't help with the case. So there's some weaknesses in this case for the prosecution, I think. Uh, again, depending on how the judge may rule. Uh, in my mind, when I wrote the file, I thought Cartel did it. That was my whole thing. He, he was involved. His excuse was too lame. But it all depends on the admissibility of evidence and, uh, again, how he presents himself. Any other, there's other questions here that... Uh, um, John, before we go to another question, I would like to remember your first visit to Turkey when you talked about a case of a pro of professor uh, who's drunken and he, he pissed in his pissed paints and you gave this example how he smells. Yes. And in this case, we made another uh, mock trial uh, in the past and one of the participants said, uh, I recognized him by his smell because his sweat was terrible smell, uh, smelling and I just saw him by his eyes, but his smell, I can never forget his body smell and I can recognize him by his by the smell was the explanation. It was a, the case we tried was a labor arbitration case That's in which correct. the person behind the counter was fired by his employer for selling alcohol to a person he knew was intoxicated. And the person was a retired professor uh, and I played the professor. <laughs> and, and, I, uh, and people started laughing because I, the clerk said I uh, wet myself I smelled terribly of body odor. I was filthy. I was unsteady on my feet. Of course, it was a uh, typical law teacher. Um, but everybody remembers me now as the old man who wet himself. So that's right. <laughs> they never forget you. <laughs> <clears throat> that's the best I've ever done. <clears throat> Let's, uh, Hassan, can you pull up the direct examination? Or do you call it examination in chief like they do in England? <clears throat> Did you have that from the stuff that Jennifer said? Doğrudan soru, which is you you pose questions without the help of the judge. Yes. You pose your questions yourself without the, because in Turkey you have to pose the questions to the judge and judge ask ask the question. But we changed this rule, and people are now entitled to ask their questions without the help of the judge. And this is called Dordan Soru, 201, Article 201 of procedure. And I think that um, in, in England, the judge can ask questions. Uh, they can in the US too, but they don't. In England, the judge will sum up at the end to a jury. Uh, and they actually, the way the judge sums up makes a huge difference in the guilt or innocence finding with the jury. Um, 
In America, the judges can't sum up the facts. In America, the judge will not ask questions. The lawyers are obligated to ask the questions on direct and cross. Judges don't interfere. In Turkey, now it's the, can the judge will still ask questions. Is that correct? Even the judge asks questions to the witness first and then leaves the floor to the parties and parties ask their questions without help of the judge. Did you find a copy of that example, um, Hassan? Um, uh, I do not have the link for that um, explanation, Professor. I'm searching for it. I can, I can probably find it. Is this on the, which one on, on direct? On the Vimeo on direct, yes. I, yeah, I can look. Are you are you using a lot of arbitration cases in in civil cases in Turkey arbitrations? Yes, we call it arbitration, also mediation. In uh, criminal cases, we have arbitration in civil and mediation in criminal. Yeah. So you do arbitrations in front of an arbitrator, correct? Uh, yes. We have also arbitration as an arbitrator, but. We have mediation, arabuluculuk ne çocuklar ya? Arabuluculuk. Mediator. Me mediator. Mediator. Mediator. So, we have a mediator. But the arbitrator is the decision maker. Yes. So it is not a mediation in civil matters and mediation in criminal matters are two different aspects in Turkey. But we have also arbitration in civil matters. We have both arbitration in, in, in civil matters and mediation, which is a sort of a negotiated settlement. Mm -hmm. um, I think our arbitrations are very much like court trials, very much like trials in your country. Yeah, yeah. Arbitrators are like judge. They make decisions. Right. Did you find it, Willow? Or yeah, not? I'm showing right now, Professor. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to talk about direct examination. It is one of the most important things that an advocate can do because without an effective direct examination, the evidence is not presented to the fact finder. Without an effective direct examination, there is nothing upon which the fact finder can make a decision. And once again, remember that in this direct examination, the listener has to absorb the information through their ears, but it is more complex than the opening statement or final argument because what we are doing is we're bouncing questions through the witness to the ears of the fact finder. And most direct examinations are poorly structured and ineffective. You see, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do in this, in this, in this direct examination, we're, we're trying to tell a story, not a theory. We're trying to present facts, not a theory. We're trying to have the witness tell, a, a, tell what happened recreating something out there in the courtroom, in the arbitration room. We're trying to create and make a picture because listeners don't see a word on a piece of paper, I saw the red light. What they are going to hear is I saw the red light and they are going to visualize. They're going to picture that. We don't picture words on a piece of paper. So as advocates, we have to see the scene itself. We have to understand what happened, not from words on a piece of paper, but how to see it as a picture's in our head. And we can't just read questions. We have to communicate directly with the witness. We have to use no big words, no complex sentences, nothing big or broad. It is a sharp, focused presentation with a structure that everybody can understand, a clear, simple structure and we can practice the direct examination on our own once again while we're walking or doing the dishes or folding clothes or driving our car if you're embarrassed about talking with a, when you're walking or driving the car buy yourself a bluetooth and pretend you're talking to someone and that gives you an advantage so you don't look like an idiot people will think you're carrying on important conversations uh, to someone who is important so you can practice anywhere and if you're running while well, you still have breath you can practice when you're running so let's think about our structure and let's think about how we're going to present. First of all, 
People think that on direct examination, the direct examiner is supposed to disappear. Now we read that. We read all about that in books and articles about direct examination. And what everyone interprets that to mean is that the direct examiner does something that's really stupid, backs out, is flat. That is odd. That calls attention to the direct examiner because it is something stupid, something out of sync going on. Because if you ask questions to someone you care about and you said something like this, how was your day? Where did you go? What did you do? What happened next? Did you have fun? That person would come up to you and say, are you okay? Is there something wrong? And of course, with that flat affect, if I kept doing it, they've had me hospitalized because it's out of sync. I look depressed or there's something gone wrong with my mind. What I need to do on my direct examination is focus all my energy, every bit of my energy on the witness. And when I do that, when I focus on the witness, when the advocate focuses on the witness, so will everyone else. You are asking questions to someone you care very much about and you're asking him questions about something that you care very much about as well. So we cannot do it flat. We cannot. Our structure, which everyone does generally, is to start out with background. Where were you born? What are your kids doing? Where were you raised? Was your high school? Was your Girl Scouts? What hobbies do you have? And no one cares about it. Advocates do it because they think they're supposed to personalize the witness, and what they have done is absolutely flatten out the witness because the advocate doesn't care and no, no, nor does anybody else. So let's think about how every word counts, everything goes to what we're trying to do, everything works. If it does not work, if it is bad music, and there's no inflection, and no good structure that makes sense, then the direct examination might as well not be there. And if it's not be there, if it's not there, nobody's heard it. If it's, nobody's heard it, the arbitrator, the fact finder, the judge, the jury, cannot make a decision. They'll make it up. So let's think about that structure and think about our eye contact and our gestures, our movement. We can use a mix of leading and non-leading questions. Absolutely. 611C of the Federal Rules of Evidence allows leading questions. The, the rule says leading questions are prohibited on direct examination, and then it goes on. Except is necessary to help develop testimony. Most people stop at the first point, but the second point is critical except as necessary to help develop testimony. Think about it. And they also go on to say that leading questions can be used for matters not in controversy, for preliminary matters, for transitions, to refresh people's recollection, and of course in cross-examination to uh, examine a hostile witness. Let's look at leading questions and look what they mean. There's three forms of questions. The totally non-leading question is who? What? Where? How? When? Why? Now, it's kind of silly to walk up to the witness and go, who? What? Where? How? When? I mean, doing that is totally open but doesn't make any sense. So we can say, who are you? Where do you work? What do you do? Now, that's focusing. It's still open-ended and non-leading. The midline leading question, do you work for picking up delivery services? Do you work for this company? The answer is yes or no. You've not suggested the answer, but you are more focused. That is a midline leading question. An advocate can do two of those. Once you get to the third, did you see an accident? Was it at 7th and Hennepin? Was it a Chevy and a Cadillac? Once you get to the third midline leading question, maybe even the second, it sounds too directive, and you're, you're going to pull an objection. The leading question is, you saw an accident. It was at 7th and Hennepin. Now, you may get away with one of those, the less experienced you are, the more likely the other side is going to object and there's going to be a sustained objection. If you practice the directs in chunks and in blocks in your little outline, you can move things around. Most of us will put it in an order, number one, A, B, C, D, and we lock into it. We lock into the structure and once locked in, it's almost impossible to change. So we're going to do it not with numbers and letters, we are going to do it with little bullet points and keeping them the same size so you can move them around and you can practice these chunks so you don't memorize it, you learn it and you have a structure that allows the witness to present the information that they know. That's a good direct examination. So when we do our direct examination, we have to have a structure. We understand that we can use a mix of leading, midline leading and open-ended questions. We are going to make everything count and we are not going to front load background. 
We are going to front load the key thing, primacy, recency, what people hear first and last, they remember the most, so we can do an outline. Here we can say it. What happened to you? I was terribly hurt. Did that affect your life? Yes. Tell us how it affected your, your life. Or I was fired. What happened to you? I don't have a job. Did that affect your wife, life? Yes, it did. Tell us how. Okay, now let me take you back to the day this happened. Let me take you back to the accident. And we can move our structure. We can do flashbacks that happened all the time. But we are not going to have a run-on series of questions that runs on like a, a three-page paragraph in a Russian novel that nobody can read. If you ever think about that, how hard it is to read a paragraph that goes on for two pages, you lose track. I fall asleep. I wake up the next day. I have to go back and read it again because I can't remember it. People are used to sound bites. Remember, our audience has to hear that. We have a different audience than 100 years ago. We have to give them sound bites, interest, movement, structure, intensity. Intensity. And that means intensity with your eyes, intensity with your body. We don't lean back. We're not afraid of it. We don't talk with our nose in the air. We don't do random pacing because we're nervous. We are planted. Our movement is for transitions. It's for changes of ideas. Every word and action counts. Now, we know what we're going to do on the direct examination. If you're like me, if I don't think about the cross, I lock in to my case and don't see the weaknesses. So one of the ways that good lawyers prepare their direct examination is to cross-examine. To cross-examine their witness first. Not necessarily cross-examine them in person, but actually prepare a cross-examination. You can take then the cross-examination, the weaknesses away on the direct examination. And if you have something terribly bad that you can't keep out because of the rules of evidence, why not admit it right from the beginning? In a jury trial, you can admit it in opening statement, perhaps even in jury selection. There's nothing to hide because if you hide it, keep it out on the, on the direct, you can absolutely expect that the good advocates on the other side will find it and go into it. There's nothing worse than having to come back and rehabilitate someone on redirect examination, right? because it shows that you've made a mistake. Why not? When you finish your direct examination, the cross-examination absolutely cannot count, because you as an advocate have covered it. You're not afraid of anything. Direct examination is a powerful tool, because most lawyers, most advocates do it poorly. Those people who are willing to practice the art of good direct examination can be at the top of the game. It takes practice. It takes concentration. You don't need a witness. You have to do it to a wall. You have to do it when you're walking. You have to get the em emphasis and the structure as you practice it so when you get into the hearing room and into the trial, you don't have to think about what you're going to be doing. You can do it. You can listen. You can hear what's happening. You can have the right inflection because it's a play that's going to happen one time. Nobody's going to hear it before. Nobody's going to hear it again. It's your one shot. You can do it. Now what I think about as I listen to your conversation, if the judge asks questions, it would not be a good idea to ask the same questions over again because the judge has heard the answers. But if there are things the judge misses or things you need to expand on, that's where the direct examination is worthwhile that you can do in the Turkey, Turkish courtroom. In the US, but the judge won't do that. So the, the approach to direct examination and the approach to examination in, in things like arbitration where the arbitrator doesn't ask questions is totally different. So you're planning what you're going to do knowing in your criminal cases that the judge is going to ask questions the prosecutor hears it, knows then what the prosecutor has to ask to augment the judge's questions, to build on the judge's questions. Faridin, am I right on that? Yes, you are right. And there are two important things to remember. In Turkish courts, the judge masters the file. The file, all contents he has read before, before he enters the courtroom, he knows the case. But in your country, the jury, they, they don't know about the case. They, don't, they didn't have a file before. And therefore, the questions asked by the parties, through those questions, the jury learns the facts. But in Turkey, the judge already knows. 
and he asks all the questions first and then leaves the witness to, to the parties. And you are right, the parties should not repeat the asked questions. They should only emphasize on those who wasn't asked. And this should be the uh, principle in Turkish courts. And I think if you know that the judge carefully reads the files, it's different than if you know the judge doesn't carefully read the files. Uh, working with arbitrators, some read them very carefully and some don't pay attention to the files at all. So knowing who your decision maker is, is really important to what questions you ask on direct examination to augment or build on the judge's questions. At the other hand, the judge, although he reads the whole file case, he, he cannot identify what the points are very important for your case. So you as a lawyer, also as a prosecutor, you may emphasize those points who are very essential for your case. Right, exactly. Not repeat everything there, but just emphasize on the vital points. Because you, by doing that in your speech, uh, after a witness examination or in your questions, you're highlighting the things that you believe are important and to give the judge the filter of looking at the evidence from your standpoint. And like Willow said, the first thing and the last thing they hear is important. So at the first, you should start with the point you mostly think it's important. And I try, I try very hard to speak in a way that that shows that I'm interested with pauses and, and, and repeats of words rather than just being flat. And so part of it is to say, Miss Anderson, Miss Anderson, where where were you? Where were you that night? Rather than Miss Anderson, where were you that night? There's a difference in your delivery that makes that, and I was talking about on the lecture. If I talk the way uh, lawyers talk in many trials, my wife would have me uh, at a, seeing a doctor because I would look extraordinarily depressed uh, and flat. Of course, uh, tone of voice, I don't know if this happens in Turkey, but in our country, tone of voice is really critical in relationships. Where we get in the biggest problems in our house it was over my tone of voice. And I don't know if that happens anywhere else, but it happens with us. And uh, I'm sure it does everywhere. Uh, then you get in an argument over what the tone of voice means rather than the discussion you're having. I'm sure that never happens in Faraday's family, but it does in ours. Um, let's, uh, uh, Hassan, can you pull up the cross-examination now? There is a um, discussion on the opening, a panel discussion oh. that's pretty short. Do you want to see that? Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Hassan, that's, do you see that one? Hasan geri dön şeye e, dönelim. Bir chat box'ta bir soru varmış. Onu soruyor Willow. Chat box'ı göster istersen. Şu an chat box görünüyor hocam ama. Eee Professor do you want me to show the uh, opening statement video right now? Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. Panel discussion, yes. Okay. As we look at the next opening statement, we're going to look at the structure of it. Because much like building a house requires a strong foundation, a good opening statement requires good structure. So let's look at the beginning of this one to see if the person goes into a nice strong grabber, something that gets our attention at the beginning. Then from there, do they go into the legal theory, legal theme of their case? Do they discuss the facts in a persuasive way? And finally, do they come back with something that gets our attention at the end as they close their opening statement. Angela? And of course, an opening statement is also a storytelling exercise. So look for those kinds of techniques. Pacing, using silence for persuasion, using vivid language to paint a picture of the facts the way that the advocate wants the decision maker to see them. And one way of creating one of those vivid pictures for the fact finder is to use impact words and action language. Look for that. And then finally, 
did they use exhibits that were appropriate for the opening statement to help explain the facts of the case to the fact finder? Now, let's take a look at the first opening. All right. So now, uh, can you bring up the cross-examination? Sure. I'm going to ask short, focused, leading questions that support our theme and have a clear structure. In my structure of this cross-examination, I'm going to first point out that Chief Troy is much more qualified than Rogers, that Troy made a series of decisions himself, particularly decisions about not following up on training for Rogers. And then I'm going to move to the Chief's knowledge about Rogers and his job demonstrating that Rogers had lots of things to do and then demonstrate that the chief had only one job that night, which was to see if he could catch someone. I'm going to demonstrate that the chief is an extraordinarily detailed person, even pointing out some of the ridiculous things that he does in his report. I'm also going to show that his first report, the one upon which Letourneau made her decision about firing Rogers, did not have very much detail in it and that the extraordinarily detailed report prepared by the chief was made only 10 days before this arbitration. I'm going to impeach the chief by demonstrating what was omitted from the first report. I'm then going to demonstrate that the signs that the chief uses to say that Roger should have known that Tollefson was intoxicated could be signs of things other than intoxication. And finally, I'm going to demonstrate that Professor Tollefson did pass a field sobriety test inside the store, and that is, he walked a straight line. Now, um, Hassan, will you show my mini little lecture on cross-examination? Do you, know, do you have that one? Do you see it? Yeah. I think it's the one I just sent to you. Okay, I'm checking it again. Mm -hmm. It's about the direct examination, the link that you sent in your last email. Uh, let's see. Cross, let's see here. Cross examination. Oh, I'll send this over to you right now. Okay. It's an, it's an amazing thing to be able to do this. Uh, and if you're falling asleep, you probably put up a picture of yourself because uh, it's getting late there, isn't it? Uh, arkadaşlar, şey bittikten sonra yine beş dakika kalıp konuşalım kendi aramızda olur mu? Hemen ayrılmayın şeyden. I ask the colleagues to stay more to discuss today's uh, topics. After you leave. Yes, we may we may quit a little bit early because I'm not going to cover. I mean, after this, after we see this cross examination, there you go. Okay, that's, that's direct. Yes, that's direct. Oh, uh, oh it is. Finding it, Hassan? Hey, I'm waiting for the link, Professor. I apologize to everyone for keeping you waiting. Did any of you had a course or talk on cross-examination before? Or is this the first time you are hearing about cross-examination? We did, did cross-examination with Phyllis Cox when there was no pandemic in school. Yeah, uh, that's correct. So Phyllis Cox talked about cross. And who else? 
there's someone else. Uh, let's, let's go on and let's take Oh, here it is. Okay, good. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Professor Vilog. <laughs> In direct examination, the advocate was presenting facts to a fact finder to enable the fact finder to prove the case, to provide the fact finder with enough information upon which the fact finder can make a decision. On cross-examination, it is just the opposite. Cross-examination is the opportunity for the advocate to test the strengths and weaknesses of the other side's case. Now, there's two types of cross-examination. There's supportive cross-examination in which the advocate is using information from the witness to support that case. On discrediting cross-examination, the advocate is really testing the strengths and weaknesses of the case. What discrediting cross-examination is all about is impeachment. And if one were to look at the general definition of impeachment, one would find that that means casting doubt on the witness, on the testimony of a witness, or on the entire case. Uh, advocates actually do impeachment in final argument when they demonstrate that the other side's case is not worthy of being believed. But in this segment, we're going to be talking about a particular kind of cross-examination, cross-examination of a witness to discredit or to challenge or to test the strengths and weaknesses of that witness's testimony. Now, in order to begin an effective cross-examination, one must start at the end. In cross-examination, if we don't know what it is we're going to argue at the end of the case, we will not be able to ask questions to support that argument. So we must first plan our final argument. Just as we had to do for opening statement and direct examination, we must understand the final argument before we can begin to construct an effective cross-examination. Once we have determined what that cross-examination is going to be, once we understand how it supports the final argument, we must design a structure. What it is that we're trying to plan, how we're going to order the the nature of the questions in that cross-examination. It should not be a free-form stream of consciousness cross-examination, although some advocates will say that's the best way because they want to confuse a witness. Really, a stream of consciousness cross-examination is not very effective because the fact finder can't take it on board. We can practice a structure. We can lay out a structure rather than putting it in numbers and letters as we talked about in our opening statement, we can use bullet points and we can get blocks of information that we can test out and practice and learn and restructure and redevelop the series of questions to be more effective. A good cross-examination has a theme, the underlying theme of the argument you're going to make. The cross-examination must support that, that theme. Suppose our theme was that the witness had a series of choices, made decisions, that the witness could have done some things, did other things, and did them because of decisions and choices that the witness made. So our argument could be, in final argument, that the witness made a series of negligent decisions, that the witness knew certain things, that the witness could have done certain things, but instead made other choices. So we're going to drive our theme of decisions, Knowledge, choices, and actions. Let's think about how we might do that. You say to the witness in cross-examination, you put the sign here, you posted the signals here, you talked about these things, you went to these places. You could have posted it in a different way. You could have put it on these boards. You could have done this. You knew you had to do certain things. You knew you had to communicate. You knew you should have been more persuasive, yet you chose not to do this. You chose not to do this. You chose not to do this. And you chose not to do this. What I have done is I've driven a theme of words in my questions. I've repeated the questions over and over again to fit with my theme, to fit with my final argument. Once we do that, once we have a theme, once we have a clear structure, we understand that we are making it easy, making it easy for the fact finder to take it on board through their ears. I cannot stress enough that what we are doing is trying to have people understand what we're doing. They get one shot to hear it, 
and they have to hear it through their ears. Don't repeat the direct examination. So many advocates will repeat certain things from the direct examination. It's boring and it hurts. For example, if a witness says, I am a doctor at Metro Hospital and I am a specialist in orthopedic surgery, oftentimes cross-examiners will do this. Aha, you're a doctor. Aha, you're a doctor at Metro Hospital. You're a doctor in orthopedic surgery. Now that's repeating the direct examination. One does not have to do that because the information that one has from the direct examination is the very basis for the cross-examination question. Because you are a doctor at Metro Hospital with a degree in orthopedic surgery, you understand how important it is to treat a fracture. Because you are an expert in the field with your degree in orthopedic surgery, you understand that untreated fractures can cause problems. Because of your experience, you understand. You see, what we've done is we've taken the direct examination question and used it as a premise or a basis for our cross-examination without repeating, repeating, repeating the direct examination. The advocate does not have to be cross to cross-examine. That means the tone of voice does not have to be cross. The form of the question doesn't have to be cross. The advocate doesn't have to pick fights with the witness. And the advocate doesn't have to have any tricks to cross-examine. Uh, let me show you what I mean by a cross-examination that's cross. Oftentimes, the advocate's voice goes down on the cross-examination. You went downtown. You crossed the street. You saw the light. Then you went home. You didn't see anybody. Now, you think about what that was. The tone went down every time. It is out of sync. There's something wrong with it. It sounds angry. And in conversations at home with the people we care very deeply about, as I said before, when we have that tone of voice, most of our arguments start from tone of voice. There's something wrong. So good discussions can often start very, very well, but all of a sudden they loop off into tone of voice or eye contact or something that was done that's out of sync. So the cross-examiner does not have to have that cross tone. One can say, you saw, you saw the light. Yes, you saw the light was green. You were looking at the light. And then after you saw the light, after you saw it, you went home. The difference in my tone of voice was between AM radio, the bounce, and FM radio, which at 12 o'clock in the morning, 12 a.m., says, hello, this is the jazz hour. It's time to go to sleep. It's time to be bored. So we're going to bounce our voice. We're going to be lively, not weak, not weak, but lively with a light tone and a light touch because people don't need to be attacked. The second thing we do is when we ask cross-examination questions, we have modifiers. At the end, you went downtown. Correct. You saw the light. Correct. You went home. Correct. Now, that's putting an emphasis on the wrong word. It's bad music. The word correct became the most important one, and by the way, most people pr pronounce it correct, not correct. The emphasis is on the wrong word. So what we want to do is emphasize with our voice, underlying the key words. You went downtown. When you were downtown, you saw the light. Yes, when you saw the light, it was green. It was green for the other traffic. You saw the accident. And after you saw the accident, you went home. The bounce of the voice, the lightness of it, the emphasis of the right words. So we, when we do a cross, we're going to make it simple, short, succinct, to the point, one question at a time. Long, complex questions are going to get long, complex answers. Long, complex questions are going to be boring. Long series of questions without themes are going to be too much. No focus means the audience, the fact finder, won't be focused. And the cross-examination should be brief, short, and succinct. The shorter it is, the less trouble we're going to get into. The longer it is, the more trouble and the more boring and the less focused the cross-examination should be. Now, on direct examination, we talked about leading questions. And we understand that primarily the questions uh, are, are, should be non-leading to allow the witness to testify. 
that we can mix leading and non-leading and midline leading questions, but the focus will be on the witness's testimony. In cross-examination, in cross-examination, it's exactly the opposite. There are a few extraordinarily talented people who can ask open-ended questions on cross-examination. And occasionally, on support of cross-examination, the advocate can do, can do that. And occasionally, there will be a time when it will be effective for an advocate to ask an open-ended question. But for most of us, for most of us who do not have the talent and probably don't have the ear for it, we should be asking all the time leading questions. Not midline leading questions, not did you go downtown? but completely leading questions like, you went downtown. Not, did you see the light, but you saw the light. Remember, we are testing our theme and our theory. We're not allowing the witness to talk. We're not allowing the witness to explain. This is not discovery. No matter how fascinated me, we might be about what the answer is, no matter how interested we might be to find out something else, at the hearing, at the arbitration, at the trial, is not the time to ask those kinds of questions. We are asking them only for the purpose of making the final argument. If we practice, and we can practice direct examination and cross-examination to a wall, if we practice it over and over, and we give ourselves the privilege of doing that, we can listen to the answers because we are not concerned so much about what we are doing. Our structure of the cross-examination will be clear, succinct, and simple. We will have practiced the questions over and over again. If we have to write one down because we can't get it right, just like on direct examination, we can pick up a piece of paper and say, I wrote this down because I wanted to get it right. Let me read it to you. And then put it down and begin your questions again. If we know what we're doing, if we know the answers, because we do, even if we don't have it in discovery, we will know the answers on cross-examination. Again, it's not discovery. So we're going to cross-examine to the areas that we know, not areas we don't know. Once we know the answer, once we've practiced, then we can listen to the witness. We can see them, and we can hear what they're saying, and we can respond to them. Because if the witness goes off and says, well, I think I did. The cross-examiner said, well, do you, you think or you know? Well, it might have happened. No, it didn't might happen. It actually happened. It could have been. No, it did happen. If we don't practice, if we don't prepare, if we don't know the answers, and we don't know ourselves, we cannot listen and respond. It is absolutely critical for us to be able to control the witness. We have to listen to what they're saying. If a witness runs on, Right? Usually it's our fault because we've asked too long a question. But if a witness doesn't answer the question, we have a right to have the witness stop. So if you said to the witness, you were standing behind the counter, and the witness said, I was standing behind the counter making change for a customer, you can stop the witness. You can say, wait, my question to you was, you were standing behind the counter. The witness says, yes, and you were making change with the customer. Yes, but I was making change and having, excuse me, excuse me, you were making change for the customer. You actually can control your voice and you can stop the witness. Don't go on too long. Don't ask the one question that you want to have that lets the witness respond. It's got to be as short as possible. It's got to be focused. It has to be focused. It has to be to the point. Because everything, everything has to count. Everything has to be designed, calculated to win and to influence. And the only way, the only way one can be an effective cross-examiner is to practice. Just like we have to practice the directs and the, and the openings, a successful, a competent, an effective advocate has to practice to be that way. Well, I think that sums up what we're going to do next week. Uh, I'm going to bring Matt Williams in. We're going to talk about, um, again, planning on the case, use of exhibits, use of Zoom, talk about strategies. We are, in my mind, about 40 minutes ahead of where I had planned to be. 
because nobody wanted to talk very much. So uh, I will make this available. We'll make this uh, Vimeo available. It is arbitration, but you can see the lectures and also the commentary. And we have about 20 different two minute little lectures by judges and lawyers from around the US that may that may apply to what you're doing. Faridin, any comments? Uh, I think we should urge our colleagues to give some ideas and talk more with us. I don't know how to achieve it, but I think it's the barrier of language. So maybe we can switch to Turkish with us, some of them if they wish. But there have be the problem, we cannot communicate with you then. But right. I would ask you and Willow to make a uh, demo. How uh, should they make their opening speech and how to make a direct and cross related to a cartel case? Right, we'll do, right. Um, we'll do that next week. Right, we'll do that next week. Prepare their uh, presentations. They would also imitate how to make it. And, and we'll think about doing it under the United States system and under the Turkish system. Yeah, under the US system, of course. Then yeah, can... I want to see if we can also think about how I might do it in the Turkish yeah. system as well. Yes. Little, any commentary? Yeah, I think that in, in summary, our direct examination, we're asking really broad, open-ended questions that start in English with words like what, where, when, how, and why. And then on cross-examination, it's really just one fact and it's more of a statement that the attorney is saying with a question mark at the end. And if you'd like, if we have extra time, not today, um, we can do some practical um, exercises on how to form that question. And I know it's been successful when I've taught this in other countries where English was not the native language. And we can try maybe some simple examples of who, what, where, when, why, how questions that we would ask on direct examination and then cross examination so that we can really control the witness very tightly. Um, so that might be one idea of how to use some of that time so that we can actually do some trial skills training if if people are interested in doing it like that. But if we'd only do it if people volunteer. I will not call on people just cold because you yeah. feel safe on Zoom that nobody gets on you. But if right, you and I think one way we can do that is by um, just talking about things that they know. <laughs> Very simple. What are you wearing? Why did you wear that? How does it feel? Um, explain what it looks like you know, things like that, because then people can use the language according to their comfort level. Maybe we can start with one experienced colleague, uh, Gulendam, tried this before. You, you may uh, use her as a, a witness maybe and ask her some questions because she did it before. Okay, good. Sure. Well, we, yeah. this is one of, one, as Willow mentioned, this is one of the drills we use in the beginning of our advanced advocacy classes, everyone stands up and faces a partner and examines on what they're seeing in front of them, their clothes. So, and then both on direct and cross. <clears throat> and it's, a, it's amazing how hard that is <clears throat> to make it look simple. So good luck everybody. I think everybody. it's a great exercise in really teaching the skill. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you everybody. And we'll see you next week on Thursday. Have a good rest of your evening. I'm sure Faridan, has things to talk about. Thank you, tomorrow. Faraday. I will see you tomorrow. Yes, on nine o'clock my time, right. All right, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, bye-bye. I'm so curious to know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> tomorrow? Ah, <laughs> got a plan, thank you. Şimdi, değerli arkadaşlar, bir hoca gördünüz, bir de talebesini gördünüz. Now, they saw, gitti, tamam. Ee, bu hoca e, tam bir Amerikan stiline göre ders veriyor. Ve anlatışın anlatışına bakın. Sizi denize attı. 
hiçbir şey anlatmadı ilk başta. Çapraz sorgu nedir? Prensip nedir? Adil yargılama vesaire. Biz halbuki derslerde nasıl başlıyoruz? Ee, Romen bir, Romen iki, küçük bir, küçük A filan diye prensipleri anlatıyoruz. Hayır bu öyle yapmadı. Bu doğrudan doğruya sizi işin içine attı. Ve emin olun beşinci günün sonunda çok daha iyi öğrenmiş olacaksınız. Bunu o birkaç sene evvel bir defa daha bir toplantı yapmıştı hoca bize. O Siddikli profesör hikayesini oynamıştı. Biraz evvel dediği gibi bir şey var. Kampüste saat 24, 21'den sonra içki satmak yasak. Bir profesörün biri gelmiş şeyden kantinden içki satın almış. Fakat e, içkili olduğunu anladığı bir kişiye içki satmaması lazım diye ruhsatı iptal etmişler filan. Fakat şeyde kendini savunuyor diyor ki e, satan kişi e, pantolonlarını işemiş. Çok sidikli kokuyordu. Yani alkollü olduğunu anlayamadım filan diye savunuyor. Yani şu bu olayı e, bir hafta anlattı bize. Ve bu çapraz sorguda nasıl sorulur, ne şey yapılır onları ortaya koydu. Yani şu anda daha henüz e, yavaş yavaş ısıyor bizi bu şeyleriyle. Fakat neler gördük bugün? Bir Şunu bir hatırlıyorum. Bir açılış konuşması diye bir şey söyledi bize. Opening speech bizde yok. Bizde 191. maddeyi hatırlayın şimdi. 191. maddede iddianamenin anlatılması getirildi. Daha evvel iddianame okunuyordu. Şimdi sana iddianın anlatılması gerekiyor. Fakat bu anlatımı başkan yapıyor. Başkan neyle suçlandığını, delillerini falan ayrıntılı bir şekilde anlatması gerekiyor. Ama daha savunmaya falan geçmedik. Sonra delillerin ikamesi başlıyor. 206. madde kapsamında. Bütün deliller ortaya konuyor. Ve 216. maddeye geliyoruz. 216. maddede bütün delillerin ikamesi sona erdikten sonra sırayla e, katılana, vekiline, savcıya filan söz veriliyor. İlk başta orada konuşabiliyor bizde müdafi. Her delil ikame edildikten sonra bir soru soruluyor. Fakat bir de esas hakkındaki mütalanın öncesinde böyle bir açılış konuşması, toparlama konuşması filan yapabiliyorsunuz. Siz savcı olarak veyahut da müdafi olarak, vekil olarak herkes konuşabiliyor. İşte ilk konuşma bu konuşma dedi. Bu konuşmada nihai konuşmanıza atıf yapın diye ikazda bulundu. Dikkat ederseniz o çok önemli bir fikirdi. Yani sonunda ne söyleyecekseniz onun taşlarını, yapı taşlarını koymaya başlayın ilk konuşmanızla. Ve bir stratejiniz olması gerekiyor davada. Baştan sona tutarlı hep savunduğunuz, ortaya koymak istediğiniz bir vurucu nokta olması lazım. Bunu Sulhi Dönmezler Hoca ampul diye şey yapardı. Yani bir öyle bir yer gelecek ki ampulü çevireceksiniz yanacak. O zaman kadar hazırlayacaksınız ama bir yerde en son bir şey koymanız gerekiyor. Onu hep hazırlayacaksınız onu. Ve ilk başta soruları bizde 59. maddeyi hatırlayın. 59. maddeye göre hakim soru soruluyor tana Ve ilk soruyu sorarken de sözünü kes, kesmeden dinler diyor. 59.1. Fakat tanık anlatımlarını bitirdikten sonra aynı hakim bu sefer söylediklerinin doğru olup olmadığını denetleyici sorular sorar diyor. Bunu e, doğrudan soruya benzetin ve çapraz sorguya benzetin Türk hukukun açısından. Yani bir hakim Türk hukukunda tanı eline aldığı vakit suyunu çıkartıyor. Her şeyi öğreniyor ondan. Dosyayı da biliyor. Ve şimdi siz vekil veya müdafi olarak olayı aldığınızda hakimin sormadığı konularda soru sorun. Savcı olarak destekleyici soru sorun. Ee, ve çapraz sorguya geldiğiniz vakit de çarbah sorguda da e, tanığın anlattıklarını çürütecek. Veya destekleyecek. İki tane çapraz sor var dedi. Supportif bir de deskriptif medya, eleştirici ve destekleyici. Yani savcı iseniz çapraz sorguda destekleyici çapraz sorgu yapacaksınız. Eğer karşı tarafsanız o zaman çürütücü. Yani ne, ya, yanlış söylediğini, doğru göremediğini vesaire ortaya koyacak sorular soracaksınız. 
Ve bu bizi şeye getiriyor şimdi. Direct question. Biz buna anlattırıcı soru diyoruz. Anlattırıcı sorular. Bir de cross examination. Çapraz sorgu diyor. isim koyuyoruz. Kanunda çapraz sorgu demiyor ama 201. maddede doğrudan soru diyor. Yani buradaki mesele şu. İlk sorularınızda tanık sizin tanığınızsa, sizin tarafınız olan bir tanıksa olayı ona anlattırmanız lazım. Onun ne söyleyeceğini siz söyleyemezsiniz. Hep e, cevabı içe saklı olmayan sorular soruyorsunuz. İşte buna 5N1K diye söylüyor. Kim, nerede, ne yaptı falan diye sorular soruyorsunuz. Bir, birinci sizin tanığınıza. Fakat karşı tarafın tanığına hep yönlendirici soru sorun dedi. Hiç anlattırıcı sormayın dedi. Ona dikkat ettiniz mi? Yani sorularınızı soru biçiminde değil, sen yaptın, sen gittin, yaptın mı demeyeceksiniz. Çünkü yaptın mı diye sorarsan açıklamaya fırsat buluyor. Fırsat vermeden doğrudan doğru siz hatasını göremediğini falan ortaya koyacaksınız. Yani bu e, Mehmet Kartal olayında şimdi önümüzdeki hafta için bir hazırlık yapalım. Siz kendi aranızda çalışın. Anlattırıcı sorular sorun bir arkadaşınıza. Bir de çapraz sorgusunu sorun. Ve bunu görmek için de bizim bir videolarımız var. Hasan Bey size onları göndersin. Bir çapraz sorgu yarışması yaptık bu sene. E, i̇lk beşi ilan edeceğiz bugünlerde. Beş kişi. Önce anlattırıcı soru modunda sordu. Yani kendisi bir e, tarafıymış gibi. Sonra karşı taraf şekline geçip aynı kişi tanığa başka sorular sordu. Çapraz sorgu yaptı. Onu bir izleyin. Fakat şeye de sırf bu olaya göre hazırlık yapın. Ve şunu söylüyor daima. Çok iyi çalışın. Detay inceleyin. Olaydaki ince küçük detaylar şeyi değiştiriyor. Çünkü sonucu değiştiriyor. O ince detayları tanığın ağzından hatalı söylediği vakit hemen yüzüne vurmanız gerekiyor. Dosyada böyleydi, şimdi böyle diyorsunuz filan diye. Ee, bir de 200 kaçıncı maddeydi? 15 miydi, 14 miydi? Duruşmada tutanak okunması ile ilgili. Ee, eğer çelişki varsa bizde tutanak okunabiliyor. Kollukta söyledikleriyle mahkemede söyledikleri arasında çelişki varsa o zaman o çelişkiyi gidermek için tanığın daha evvel söylediklerini okuyabiliriz. Yoksa bütün söylediklerinin duruşmada söyledikleri olması lazım. Doğrudanlık ilkesi gereğince. Şimdi ben sizden şey sormak istiyorum. Yani bu şekilde çalışmak tatmin edici mi? Daha nasıl şekillendirelim? Ve özellikle de sizin İngilizce konuşmanızı ben istiyorum. Yani mutlaka hepiniz çok iyi İngilizce biliyorsunuz ki bu ıı, takip edebiliyorsunuz. Yani şu anda 31 kişi var. 31 kişinin de tümü İngilizceyi anlıyor demek ki. Yani şu ana kadar takip etti bütün şeyleri. Sorun yaşamadı. Ama hiç şey yapmayın, tereddüt etmeyin. Ağzınıza gelin söyleyin. Yani doğru konuşacağım diye bir gayret içine girmeyin. O anda aklınıza ne fikir geliyorsa fikri söyleyin siz. O anlama çalışır olmazsa bir daha söylersiniz. Bir daha söylersiniz. Sorun yok yani. Hiç tereddüt etmeyin konuşmakta. Bu sizi açacaktır. Yani bilmiyorum bana söyleyeceğiniz bir şeyler var mı bu konuda? Nasıl çalışalım diye. Bir defa Gülendam geçen şeyde bu bir toplantıda bir Amerikalılarla yaptığımız şeyde tanık rolünü oynamıştın. Sana sorular sormuşlardı. O konuda sen tecrübelisin. Yani bir arkadaşla siz eşleşin öncelikle. Burada size sorular sorsun o arkadaş İngilizce olarak. Yani çok olmazsa önce bir demo yapalım. Haftaki şey için. E diğer arkadaşlar da ikişer ikişer hazırlıklı olsunlar. O soru sorduğu vakit çıkın konuşun. Yani konuşarak öğrenirsiniz. Ben burada sizden hepinizin bir şeyler öğrenmenizi istiyorum bu şey içerisinde. Hocam. Evet. E, bu pandemi öncesi Filiz Cox'la yaptığımız alıştırmalar gibi anladığım kadarıyla. Ne evet. Gülendam da vardı. Evet. Ne katılmıştık. O zaman e, Gülendam'la ikiniz eşleşin isterseniz ilk başta. Ya da başka arkadaşlarla ya da üçlü yapın. Yani mutlaka bir interaktif bir şeyler yapalım. Çünkü o hedefimiz o. Siz ileride bir Amerika'daki, Londra'daki bir büroya gittiğinizde konuşmanız gerekecek. Konuşun yani. Hiç çekilmeden konuşun. Görüşleriniz? Rehber Bey. 
Hocam bir şey sorabilir miyim? Pardon kameramı açayım. Hocam merhaba, iyi akşamlar. Ya hocam şimdi biz hep e, filmlere de görüyoruz. Bu sorulan sorulara Amerikan hukukunda itiraz etme diye bir şey var, durum var. Türk hukukunda da bu var mı? Mevcut mu itiraz etme? Birinci maddede e, soru sorulduğu vakit bu anlattırıcı soru, çapraz soru sistemine aykırıysa yani kendi tanığına ağızdan laf sokacak şekilde soru soruyorsa siz itiraz edeceksiniz. O itirazı da başkan değerlendiriyor hemen. Bu soru sorulur, sorulamaz diyor. Kaynağında 206. madde alıyor. CMK 206'ya göre delil ikamesinde başkan karar verir. O sorunun sorulup sorulamayacağına dair hemen bir karar vermesi gerekiyor başkanın. Bizde de var bu itiraz, evet. Ama sizin hazır hocam teşekkür ederim. Bu şekilde itiraz etmeniz lazım. Çünkü şey diyorlar, yenmiş kuzu bitmiştir diyorlar. Eğer ağzından çıkarsa bir laf duyuluyor. Duyulduğu vakitte delil oluyor. Onu söylemeden durdurmanız gerekiyor. Hemen itiraz ediyorum bu soru sorulamaz diye durdurmanız lazım. Anladım hocam. Bir de bir şey sormak istiyorum hocam. Biz de pratik yapmak istiyoruz ama nasıl eşleşeceğiz? Arkadaş da yazmış bir tanesi de chat baksa. Valla şu anda hemen kendi aranızda konuşun. Mesela şunu iki kişi eşleşti. Siz de e, rehber değil mi isminiz? Mesela Elif yahut da Ramazan birisiyle eşleşin. Yani birkaç arkadaş, iki üç kişi olsa yetiyor zaten. Herkese vakit olmaz. Hiç olmazsa şöyle bir soru sor, sor, o sırada sorabilirsiniz, şey yaparsınız. Ben ee, şey, WhatsApp grubu istenmiş. Ben isterseniz hemen bir açık link atabilirim. Eğer herkes için kolaylık olacaksa, hani şeyse, zor olacaksa şu an eşleşmek. Ben hemen bir grup açabilirim istiyorsanız. Öyle yapalım. Hemen bir Baş... saniye. Büşra... Hocam en nihayetinde rol play kim mi olacak acaba? Hani e, bir kısım işte... Hemen açıp bağlantı, ya kayıt savcı... şeyini linkini atacağım buraya. İki dakika içerisinde. Bir kısım arkadaş savcıyı, bir kısım arkadaş Şimdi... avukatı canlandırır şekilde mi? Hani o tarz bir şey mi düşünüldü acaba? Hani ona Tam göre bir... Çift baksa atacağım hemen açıp grubu. Bizim burada bir olayımız var. Olayımızda Mehmet Kartal'ın bir suç işlediği iddia ediliyor. Mehmet Kartal'ı kurtarmak yönünde bir şey yapalım önce. Sorular öyle olsun. Yani Mehmet Kartal'a müdafi olarak girişin. Sonra bir başka arkadaş da Mehmet Kartal'ın değil de o ev sahibi kadının vekili gibi olsun. Ve o o, tön, o yönlü sorular sorsun. O karşı taraf, öbür bu taraf. Ya savcı olarak sorsun. Savcı olaya, bizde de tabii ki savcının da rolü büyük. Ağır cezalarda olacak o artık. Evet. Gerçi askerlik davaların çoğu artık şimdi seri yargılamayla falan gidiyor. Evet hocam. Şimdi yeni reform paketinde onu da gelişmek, genişletmek de istiyorlar. Daha seri yargılamanın şeyini oldukça genişletecek galiba öyle gözüküyor. Evet. Ya, Baksa bağlantı attım WhatsApp grubu için. Tamam, teşekkürler. Bir de yarın unutmayın, yarın son Stengen şeyi var bu hukuk eğitimi. Aslında her gün var hafta içerisinde. Haftaya salı günde Türk hukuku günü var. Hep İngilizce oluyor konuşmalar ama salı günkü tercümeli olacak. Gerçi sizin tercüme ihtiyacınız yok. Onu Hasan Bey size gönderdi. Diğer günleri de gönderir eğer isterseniz. Hemen tekrar yolluyorum hocam. Bütün günleri ve bütün programı. Yani yarınkinde son sen ikinci konuşmacı. Çok ilginç konuşmalar oluyor. Tavsiye ederim. Sonra internetten de izleyebiliyorsunuz geri dönüş YouTube'dan. Onu da yapabilirsiniz daha sonra. Ya pandemi sonrasında hukuk eğitimi nasıl değişti Amerika'da çok ilginç. Yarın şey de anlatacaklar. Duruşmaları falan da anlatacaklar. Bu online duruşmaları. Bizde henüz online olmuyor cezada ama Amerika'da başlamış. Bu kedi hikayesini ortaya çıkarttılar. Youtube'da gördünüz mü bilmiyorum. Bir avukatın biri şeyi unutmuş. Çocuğunun koyduğu resmi. Duruşmaya kedi, kedi şeklinde çıkmış. Kedi avukat diyorlar şimdi onunla. Hasan bunu paylaşır mısın arkadaşlarla? Hocam hatta Tabii şey ki. diyor. Gördünüz mü? Diyor kedi olarak görünebilirim ama kedi değilim diyor konuşmasında. <gülüyor> Bir de şeyi izleyin, e, Trump'ın e, 
Senato'daki şeyinden çok söz ettiler. Her, hepsi, hepsi. Yani orada şimdi bu ikna edici konuşma, persuasive argumentation falan orada örneklerini ortaya koyuyorlarmış. Tabii en meşhur avukatları, en şey tam bu bizim şeye benzer bir şey göreceksiniz orada. Onda herhalde YouTube'da falan bulunabilir şey olarak. Evet, akademide nasıl gidiyor işler? Dersler falan devam ediyor mu? Online mi oluyor? Canlı mı ders yapıyorsunuz? Hocam şu an yüz eğitim devam ediyor. Hali hazırda e, 600 son dönem adayımız var. 84'te avukatlık döneminden hazırlık eğitimi alan arkadaşlarımız var. Biz pandemiden bu yana sadece bir dönem e, uzakta eğitimi yaptık. Onun dışında hep yüz yüzeydi. Fakat çok büyük atılım yaptı Muhittin Bey. Ha, Muhittin Bey'in de konuşması var şeyde. Ne günü o Hasan? Salı günü mü? Haftaya salı günü. Çıkacağım diyordu sanki başkanımıza. Evet hocam 16 Şubat günü. Hasan Bey biz de linki de paylaşabilir değil mi Sayın Hocam? Hani bu akademideki arkadaşlarımıza da belki katılmak isteyen olursa diye mümkünse. Tabii yani... hemen tekrar çete yapıştırıyorum. Tamam. Orada tüm program e, var. Oradan e, bir kayıt alıyoruz. E, register evet. here butonu var. E, kayıtı aldığınızda size tüm programı ve tüm Zoom linklerini gönderiyoruz. Çünkü her bir konferans günü için ayrı bir Zoom linkimiz var. Hı, anlıyorum. Peki sağ olun. Allah'a ayrıldım. Nasıl savunurdunuz eğer siz Mehmet Tatal'ın avukatı olsaydınız, müdafi olsaydınız, birkaç arkadaş şey söylesin, görüş söylesin, bir de iddia makamı olarak nasıl suçlardınız, bunları kendi için konuşalım, netleştirelim, onları daha çok vurgulayın yarınki ya haftaya konuşmamızda. Şimdi müdafi açısından. Bir hukuk aykırı delil meselemiz var. Fakat şeyde çok güçlü iddia makamı. Çünkü evden alınan, çalınan şeyler e, arabada bulunmuş bir kısmı. E, sonra işte maske bulunmuş, beyzbol sopası var, şapka var. Yani o şeyi, sanığı, olaya bağlayan çok kuvvetli deliller var. Ama hukuk aykırı delil üzerinden mi gitmeli? Yoksa başka türlü strateji mi geliştirmeli? Bir savunma stratejisi bir düşünelim. Bir de iddia savun stratejisi. Yeterli delil var mı? Mahkumiyete götürecek kadar delil var mı? Hukuk uygun mu? Yani bir dava siz açacak olsaydınız ve sonra mahkumiyet hükmü kuracak olsaydınız nasıl gerekçelendirirdiniz? Gerekçe meselesi çok önemli. Bir de tabii ki tutuklama kararı. Tutuklama kararı verilirse bu olayda nasıl bir gerekçe konurdu? Bu 3-4 noktayı söz almak ister misiniz? Kim konuşmak ister? Önce müdafi açısından bakalım. Hocam ben şöyle bir şey eklemek istiyorum. Biz bunu Türk hukuku açısından siz değerlendirmiştiniz, ben izlemiştim. Daha içerisinde Mehmet Kartal... O gece kendisinin kız arkadaşıyla birlikte olduğunu söylüyor. Yanlış hatırlamıyorsam ifadesinde. Yani bu da sağlam bir, eğer doğruysa tabii ki bir nokta olabilir mi? Bu Mehmet Kartal'ın son stengin verdiği dosyada evde yalnızdım diye iddia ediyor galiba. Yani biz bunu başka zaman oynamıştık bu olayı. O zaman kız arkadaşımın yanındaydım diye iddia ediyordu ama bu olayın bu şeklinde evde yalnızdım diyor galiba. Söyle mi Hasan? Sen hatırlıyorsun. Anladım hocam. Ee, evde olduğunu söylüyor fakat ev sahibesinin e, odadan hiç çıkmadığını yani bir görgü tanığı olmadığını biliyoruz. Yani onu evet. kendi ifadesine göre. Evet. Yani Ali bir iddia etmiyor. Başka yerde olduğunu iddia ediyor. Yani olay yerinde ol, olmadığını Ali bir iddiası var. Hocam riskli bir alan ama savcı olsaydım ben HTS kaydını isterdim. Eğer telefon üzerindeyse çünkü dışarı çıktığı anda sinyal verecekti. O sinyal bilgilerinden onu bulurduk hemen. Mükemmel. Güzel bir nokta. Çünkü orada, ya yani ben onu söyleyecektim. Son, haftaya sakladım. Yani ekstra delil elde edebiliyor muyuz diye. Mesela kamera kaydı, MOBS kamera kayıtlarında herhangi bir şekilde aracın orada hareketlendiğini görürsek o zaman savcı için yeter delil oluşmuştu. Mahkumiyete benim kararatim. Yani hukuk aykırı deliller var galiba. Amerikan sistemine göre biraz izledim sizin programlarınız. Hani orada bir şey var. İşte plain view vesaire ama hani diğer deliller desteklenirse hiç çıkmadım diyen adamın dışarı çıkması halinde en azından o 
savunup çürütebilirdik savcı olarak. Parmak izi var. Parmak izinden söyle. Şüphesiz. O da var. Parmak izi de var. Hani dışarı çıkmanın diyor çıkıyor vesaire. Ne bileyim mabese kamera kaydı gibi kamera kaydı olabilirdi. Türk hukuku açısından baktığımızda bir kısım hukuka uygun delil varsa, hukuka aykırı delil de olsa hüküm kurulabiliyor. Mesela en son bu şey kararı var. Ee, Yeşilköy Havaalanı'nda bir e, yabancı turist kadının vajinasından e, uyuşturucu madde almış polis. Aynı hocam. O olayı da hatırlarsanız daha evvel elinde bir balon varmış. Balonun içerisindeki uyuşturucu maddeleri almış. Daha sonra kadın tuvalete gitmek istemiş. Polis de şüphelenmiş. Çok hukuk aykırı bir şekilde vajinasından kendisi eliyle almış. İş beden muayenesi aykırı evet. Delil. Ama daha evvelki deliller var. Onunla hüküm kurabilirsiniz dedi. Şey, Anayasa Mahkemesi orada şey bulmadı. Yani elde edilen bir kısım hukuka uygun delil varsa yetiyorsa da Türk hukuku şey yapıyor bununla yetiniyor. Peki başka ne diyorsunuz? Yani bu ama lehte şimdi savunma açısından soruyorum ben sizlere. Tabii. Yani olmadığını ortaya koyacaktı değil mi telefonda? Tabii, tabii hocam. Şeyinden orada olmadığını ortaya koyacaktı. Başka neler aklınıza geliyor savunma olarak? Ben yeni versiyonunu okumadım davanın şey o eski hani işte kız arkadaşım benim dediği haliyle daha önce çalışmıştık Kartal davası üzerinde. Bu şimdiki versiyonu okumaya fırsatım olmadı ama hani sanırım sokakta teşhis ediyor yanlış hatırlamıyorsam evet, evine ya. girilen kişi Kartal'a. Yani uygun teşhis yok. Ha, uygun teşhis yok mesela onun üzerinden de gidilebilir çünkü zaten olay gece gerçekleşmiş çok ani olmuş her şey. Bir anda o sokakta gördüğü ya da şimdi, hani uygun olmayan bir ortamda gördüğü kişi evet buydu diye teşhis etmesi bence çok kabul edilebilir bir teşhis değil. Bunun üzerinden de gidebilir. Hani bu kişinin kartal olduğu ne malumdan da gidebilir. Yani tamamen yanlış kişi şu an buradan değerlenebilir belki. Evet. Belki de. Buyurun başka. Eğer teşhiste bu kadar sıkıntı varsa o zaman hani eşkalle de ilgili bir sıkıntı olduğunu söyleyebiliriz. Bu durumda eşkalle ilgili bir sıkıntı varsa sikibi de şüpheli durumuna gider. Çünkü arabada o da bulundu. O da aynı evde kaldı ve sonra gitti geldi. Ve o da aynı arkadaş grubunda, aynı ortamlarda bulunan ve şüpheliler arasında polis tarafından, polis tezlinde görülen kişilerden bir tanesi. Yani bu e, teşhisle eşkal birlikte mi sorunludur? Onu oradan hareket edip bir kişi yaratabiliriz. ikinci bir şüpheyi yaratabiliriz kipi olarak. Ayrıca eğer Harry'i bir savunma olarak Harry'nin gerçekten var olduğunu söyleyip böyle bir kişinin şüpheyi ona da yönlendirebiliriz. Ama tabii ki savcı tarafındaysak, prosecution tarafındaysak da bu kişi kolaylıkla hani böyle bir kişi görülmemiştir. Bu işte e, sadece şüpheyi arttırmak ve dikkati e, o tarafa celbetmek için uydurulmuştur gibi buna da tabii bir cevap gelebilir. Ama sonuçta üçüncü bir kişi de var elimizde. Yani iki ve üçüncü kişiler de şüpheli olarak yaratılabilir bir çaba gösterilirse diye düşünüyorum. Yani şöyle bir sıkıntı var. Bu Amerikan polisin çok yaptığı bir iş. Bizde de var zannediyorum. Bir şüpheli ele geçirdikten sonra şeyi sona erdiriyorlar araştırmayı. Yani bu olayda da şeyi araştırmamışlar. Ee, savunmanın ileri sürdüğü hususu araştırmamışlar. Bu bir adil yargılama hakkı ihlali. Çünkü şey iddia ediyor. Ben yoktum orada. Arabayı bilmem kime verdiydim diyor. O arabayı kullanan kişiyi bulup ortaya çıkartmaları gerekirdi. Lehte delil. Yani halbuki savcının hem lehte hem aleyhte delil araştırması gerekirken eksik soruşturma var burada. Yani bu da bir şey bakımından e, tahime kadar gitse, annesi mahkemesine gitse e, ihlal nedeni olacak bir şey, eksiklik. Önemli bir eksiklik, eksik soruşturma. Evet yani sanki delilden zanlıya gidiş değil de, pardon... Yani delilleri tam araştırmamışlar. Bir de hocam pardon araya girdim ama eşgal konusunda yani çok genel bir eşgal var ortada. Yani çok fiziksel olarak delilleyici mesela dövme gibi işte gerek o boyutla yani bir insanın boyutunun çok farklı olması gibi belirleyici eşgaller yerine daha genel bir eşgal söz konusu ki Amerika'da çok sık rastlanan insan tiplemesi var burada. 
polisin buna baz alarak yani birini bulması ve birine ulaşması zaten çok mümkün değil gibi. Bir de şey dedi mi şapka var. Çok kullanılan bir şapka diyor. Ama her evde bulunan bir şapkayı o evde de bulmuş. Yani bu da bir lehte bir şey ama olay sırasında şapka var. Aynı şapkanın bir benzeri de evinde bulunuyor. Yani yine bir basit şüpheden de az de indikatör desek bir şey var gene yani. Tamamen kopukta değil. Hafif bir bağlantı var ama delil olarak, olarak kullanamayacak bir şey. Peki savcı bakımından bakın bir de meseleye. Savcı olarak yeterli delil var mı burada iddianamacı zannemek için? Var hocam. Var. Bir kere her şey önemlisi bizim hukukumuza göre zaten e, legal. E, polis memuru aracı içerisinde görülebilir aranda şeyi görmüş, mücevher kutusunu görmüş. Orada bir geçmiş olsun durumu var gibi. Çünkü netice itibariyle hani en azından şahsa şunu sormak lazım. Hadi dışarı çıkmadın etmedin. O mücevher kutusu oraya nasıl geldi? Hani bunun mantıklı açıklaması yapabilecek mi? Artı parmak izi var. Hani diğer deliller belki hukuk aykırı desek bile halinizdeki deliller hem kamu davası açmaya yeter hem de kanaatimce hani ilerleyen safhalarda tabii bizim hukukumuzda dediğiniz gibi şahıs eğer deseydi ki evet benim aracım ben Herald'a verdim biz mutlaka Herald'a ulaşırdık. Yani böyle bir şahıs var mı? Verdi mi? İşte atıyorum o gün e, ne yapıyordun diye mesela bir sorgulardık. Mesela evde ne yapıyordun diye sorardım mesela ben savcı olsam. Yaptığı şeye mesela eğer denetleyebilir bir şeyse atıyorum bayis oynadım. Acaba bayis oynadım oynamadım evde. Yani o tarz onun e, çürütebilecek aynı zamanda lehine olabilecek delilleri toplardım. Burada o yüzden bir yeterli delil olduğu gibi bence mahkumiyete giden bir yolda var gibi. Tamam. Bir de tutuklamayı düşünelim. Burada tutuklanır mıydı? Tutuklama kararı verilir miydi? Kaçma şüphesi, deli kartma şüphesi var mı? Kuvvetli suç şüphesi var mı? Ve hukuk uygun delile dayanıyor mu? Tutuklama kararı. Yani tutuklama kararı verilirken hukuka aykırı delil kullanılır mı? Evet. Yani bence tutuklamalık bir durum yok açıkçası. Çünkü zaten olay gerçekleşmiş olabilen, yani zaten çok delil olacak bir olay değil. Yani onlar da toplanmış. Zaten hani, tam suç kötü bir suç ama yani insan öldürmemiş bu sonuçta ve biz tutuklamaya olabilecek en sıkı koşullarda başvuruyoruz. Çünkü hani zor bir güvenlik tedbiri insanın özgürlüğünün önceden hani ceza kararı verilmeden önce kısıtlanması. O yüzden bence çok da tutuklanmasına gerek yok gibi. Fazla hümanist farklı ama. Bizim yani... hukukumuza göre hocam olabilir çünkü şey var. Hani katalog suç olması bir yana mesela orada aracı birisine verdim diyor. Ancak aracı kime verdi? Acaba mesela birine söyleyecek de öğütleyecek mi? Aracı verdim de, de mi diyecek? Mesela etkilenme ihtimali var. Hani delilleri karartma artı değiştirme ihtimali. E şimdi somut olayımızda mesela onların hukukuna sanıyorum. Hani evden hırsızlık var mesela bizde. Olay yağmaya bile dönüşebilir. Hani bilmiyoruz olayın oluş şeklini. Tam olarak hani gelip geçtiyse tamam evden hırsızlık. E gece vakti. Gork dokmazlı ihlal, mala zarar verme, üçlü bir arada düşündüğümüz zaman hani olayın oluş şekli itibariyle sıradan açıktan mırsızlık da değil. E, akabinde toplayacağımız delilleri etkileme olasılığına göre bence tutuklamadı pek tabii düşünebilir. Şimdi olayda yağma yok. Çünkü... Yok yok hani şey itibariyle şimdi savcı bakış açısı şimdi o anda çünkü bu soruşturma yapacağız ya e, Sayın Hocam. Hani bize intikal etme şekli çok önemli. Hani o anda biz daha bilemiyoruz. Mağduru dinleyeceğiz. Mağdur acaba bir herhangi bir e, o anda şeye bir uğramış mı? Bir baskı şiddete uğramış bir uğramasa bile halihazırda evden hırsızlık e, katalog bir suç e, delilleri değiştirme gizleme olasılığı olabilir bizim hukukumuza göre belki onlarda hani onlar bıraktılar ama ben bırakmazdım mesela Herald'ı bir araştırdım Herald var mı acaba böyle bir şey var mı aracı e, belki satacak belki biz başka delile ulaşamayacağız gibi farklı ihtimalleri düşünürdüm ben olsam Fakat adam <gülüyor> Amerika'da <gülüyor> serbest kaldı anda kaçar mı? Yani Amerika biraz farklı olabilir hocam ama bizde yani ne yazık ki biraz Türkiye olarak fazla etki Türkiye'de bir Amerika'da bir sürü böyle bir olaya karıştı. Serbest bıraktığın anda kaçar. Yani işte. Yani şimdi kaçma şüphesi var mı diye bakarsan olayda yabancıların işledikleri suçlarda kaçma şüphesi daha çoktur. Ve karşıda bir daha da bulamazsın. Evet. Yani tutuk da meseleyi düşünün ama kaçma şüphesini göster olgu gerekiyor ve delil karartma ama Gülendam dedi ki deliller toplanmıştı zaten toplanacak başka delil var mı bu olayda pek yok galiba yani olaylar oraya göre yok ama bize göre vardı mesela ben Herod'a ulaşırdım mesela Herod'a ulaşana kadar bir tutardım acaba gerçekten böyle bir vatandaş var mı yok mu? Her oldu şey bulunması 
Ama eğer zaten bir Harold söz konusuysa ya yani ortada gerçekten böyle bir insan varsa onun bulun, onun bulunması e, kartalın da yararlı olacağı için onu karartmaya çok çalışmaz. Bence yardım da dokunabilir onun. Ama zaten Ama yoksa mesela parmak hani, izle yetimleri bence şey moleküler genetik incelemeye giderdim mesela ben parmak izle yetinmezdim. Parmak izle mesela şey yapabilirdi. Moleküler genetik inceleme düşündüm mesela. Daha Hı-hı. böyle destekleyici, daha böyle hani e, spesifik örnekler üzerinden gitmeye çalışır. İşte ETS kaydı, kamera kaydı bir yerleri biraz daha şey olabiliyor. Hani spekülasyona da açık olabiliyor deliller itibariyle. E onu toplayana kadar da tutabilirdik yani. Hani en azından bakış açısı itibariyle. Yani. İşte bak, bütün bunları e, mahkeme önünde sözle söyleyebilmek lazım. Fakat Hı. hakim sizi ne kadar dinler? Kaç dakika dinler? Üç dakika mı dinler? İşte avukatlar için konuşuyorum tabii. Savcılar pek konuşma bizde ama. Yani bir avukatın Hakimin öne çıktığı vakit söyleyebileceği, atabileceği dört dört kurşun var. Onları da güzel atması lazım. E, i̇nandırıcı, duyurabilici. E, ne diyor kız? E, Wilson, Will, Will, Will, Will mıydı kızın ismi? Will. Hiç, diyor. Hiç e, şey giriş girişmeden, e, selam sabaha girişmeden adam suçu işlemedi falan diye ilk başta bir şey söylerim diyor. Ön sonra bir defa daha söylerim diyor. Yani onları düşünün. Bunlar taktik meseleler ama çok önemli şeyler. Yani bu dersin de bu seminerin de hedefi bu zaten. Etkin bir şekilde bir mahkeme önüne çıktığınız vakit şey yapabilin, söyleyebilin ama bu yurt dışına bir mahkeme olacaktır. Yani Türk hukuk, Türkiye'deki şeyi hedeflemiyoruz. Biz sizde dışarı hazırlamak istiyoruz. Bütün şeyimiz bu. Gayretimiz hem İngilizce konuşacaksınız etkin konuşacaksınız. Olayı takip edebileceksiniz. Falan. Çok hukukçuluk zor bir şey. Peki. Başka görüşler var mı? Yoksa bu akşam için kapatalım. Var mı görüşleriniz? Ee, bir konuya değinebilir miyim hocam? Tabii. Um, Sarah ifadesinde diyor ki he was carrying a baseball bat and he knocked me down. Burada yağmur suçu oluşmuş olmuyor mu en başta? Şimdi yağma suçu e, alırken cebir kullanması gerekiyor. Ondan sonra kullanırsa artık o suç oluşmuyor. Yani öyle bir iştahat var. Alır, almak için cebir kullanılırsa diye iştahatımız böyle. Daha sonraki cebir şeye girmiyor. Yağmaya sokmuyor fiili. Yani Türk ee... hukuku öyle diyor. Amerikan hukukunu bilmiyorum. Fakat o burger diye şey yapıyor. Evden kapı kırarak plan girmelerin hepsini burglary diye alıyor onlar. Hı hı. Bizde nitelikli hırsızlık diyebileceğimiz bir suç tipi. Bir de bu meseleler var tabii. Şimdi diyelim ki bu Mehmet Kartal kaçtı Türkiye'ye geldi. Ve Amerika Türkiye'de yargılanmasını istiyor. Şimdi nasıl yargılayacağız biz bunu? Hangi suça sokacağız? Oradaki Mahkeme ne aşamaya kadar geldi buna bakacağız bir defa. Eğer orada bir hüküm kurulmuşsa orada kurulan kararın burada infazı mı isteniyor? İnfazın aktarılması mı söz konusu olacak? Yoksa sadece hiç hiçbir işlem yapılmadan kaçtıysa kovuşturmanın aktarılması müessesesi var. İade mi istiyor? İade edemiyoruz. Vatandaş iade edilmez. Ama Mehmet Kartal orada şeyse Sonradan Amerikan vatandaşı olmuş bir Türkse mesela, onun durumu ne olacak filan. Her biri değişik hukuki problemler getirecek tabii olayın akışına göre. Türkiye'de yargılansaydı. Bir de o aramalar, e, rızai arama var diyor. Rızai aramayı Amerikan hukuku kabul ediyor. Biz de kesin kabul etmiyoruz. Şimdi Amerika'da rızai aramayla edilmiş delili biz kabul edecek miyiz? Ee, şey vermeyin. Çünkü milletler arası ceza hukukunda e, yurt dışındaki kurallara uygun olarak elde edilen deliller iç hukukta kullanılabiliyor. O konuda bir şey var. E, milletler arası adi yardımlaşma Avrupa Sözleşmesi'nde hüküm var. Her ülkenin kendi hukukuna göre elde ettiği deliller diğer hukukta örtüşmese bile Kullanılır. Yeter ki kamu düzenine aykırı olmasın filan. Yani çok tartışmalı hukuki problemlere girebilirsiniz daha sonra. Ama bütün bunların önemlisi o hukuki problemi gözüne sokacak şekilde söyleyebilmektir. İkna edebilecek şekilde söyleyebilmektir. O bir beceri. 
O da avukatın becerisi işte. Avukatın söz dinletebilmesi gerekiyor mahkemede. Lafını duyurması, duyurabilmesi, noktasını aydınlatabilmesi, ortaya koyup ikna edebilmesi gerekiyor heyeti. Sözle. O iki dakikalık konuşmada ne söyleyebilirse o. Bir de ne diyor sonuçta? Gece gündüz ben çalışıyorum diyor. Yani o davada ne söyleyeceğimi ezberliyorum diyor. Hiç hata yapmamak için çok vaktim yok. Üç tane cümle kurduk. O üç cümleyle şeye gitmesi lazım. Sonuca gitmesi lazım. İkna etmesi lazım filan. Hocam e, polis Marti eve girmeden önce izin alıyor e, Kartal'dan ama haklarını bildirmemiş oluyor. Bildirmeden bunu yapıyor. Ya, bu da bir sorun yaratmaz mı? Tabii evet. o da o da hakların bildirilmemesi ayrı bir şey. O da ayrı bir ihlal. Bir anda kuralını ihlal etmiş oluyor. Hı -hı. Hakların bildirmemesi. Peki arkadaşlar o zaman Hocam bir şey de ben söyleyebilir miyim? Sen? Ee, hocam ben de bir şey söylemek istiyorum. Buyurun Mehmet, buyurun. Ee, sayın Hocam, şey, e, tutuklamaya baktığımız zaman burada gözüken şu, e, sadece e, e, teşhiste e, Ramsey'in e, evet budur demesi var. Onun haricinde çok kuvvetli dili göremiyoruz. Az önce de yazdım e, chatbox'tan. Yani evet. mücevher kutusunun üzerinde de şey yok. E, parmak izi yok. Hı. Teşekkürler Sayın Hocam. E, bakalım savcı arkadaşlar ne diyecek? Hakim arkadaşlar. Araçta evet. olması biraz işi değiştiriyor hocam. Nasıl? Araçta olması biraz yani orada bulunması yani e, kişinin buna Sayın Hocam orada ar araçtaki, araçtaki parmak izleri evet e, sahibine ait ama diğerleri Teşhis edilemiyor. Identification yok. O yüzden... Yani oraya nasıl geldiğini açıklayamazsa. Yani hani bunu makul yani uçarak gelecek hali ya. Onu bir makul açıklama getirmesi lazım. Yok. Şöyle e, teknisyen çok uzman birisine benziyor. Bunları daha detaylı araştırmalıydı diye değerlendiriyorum. Ayrıca e, o sırada şey değil. Bulun, bulunmuyor. E, yani şey olarak. E, tanık olarak. E, bunu da sorgulamak gerekir diye değerlendiriyorum. Çünkü çok tecrübeli birisine Ama... benziyor. E, Evet. Şey eldiven giyiyordu. Eldivenlerden Doğrusu, bahsedildi de parmaklarının gizli olmaması. Doğru, doğrusunuz e, eldivenlerden bahsediyor ama e, eldivenler malumunuz odasından da çıkıyor. E, onun almış olması ihtimalini e, çok uzak bir şey. Arabanın içerisinde başka izler de var diyor. Yani evet e, iki, iki izlerden e, e, kartalın iz, izleri var direksiyonda ve şeyde ama başka bir sürü parmak izi daha var diyor yani. Burada olay aslında tutuklamaya giden şey sadece teşhis. Evet arabanın içerisinde e, kartalın e, parmak izlerinin olması zaten doğal bir şey, olağan bir şey. Diğerleri araştırılmalıydı. Yani sadece oradan tutuklamaya gitmesi yanlış bence. Teşekkürler. Şimdi bakın e, bir kişi yakalanıyor. Saat kaçta yakalandı? 20.30'da diyelim. 24 saat içerisinde hakim önüne çıkartılıyor. Ve 24 saat içerisinde sağ, polis ne elde ettiyse o kadar şeyle de hakim bir tutuklama kararı veriyor ya da vermiyor. Şimdi burada prima facie dediğimiz ilk görüş, ilk bakıştaki bir kanaat söz konusudur. Olayın tümü daha aydınlanmamış. İlk bakışta suç işlediği konusunda bir şey var mı? İzlenim. Ee, kendi arabasında bulunmuş. Da, daha lehinde birçok şey var tabi ama kadına teşhis etmiş yani olayı Mehmet'i bağlayan çok e, kuvvetli bir şey var olayda fakat bunlar hukuka uygun mu bir ikincisi de e, lehe bazı şeyler var mı Şimdi eğer siz müdafi iseniz bu tutuklama oturumunda bu söylediklerini söylemeniz gerekiyor ve demeniz gerekiyor ki bakın Mehmet'in lehinde de şunlar şunlar var Bunları ben toplanması istiyorum demeniz lazım. CMK 147'ye bakın. 147. maddede ifade alma ve sorgu sırasında lehe olan şeylerin de ileri sürülmesi mümkündür. Ve o hakimin o oturumda onu araştırması gerekiyor. Yani sizin lehe söylediklerinizi, Mehmet'in lehine bu söylediklerinizi, o otomobilin içerisinde tabii ki onun parmak izi olacak başkalarının aramış, araştırması lazım filan demenizi araştırması lazım. Ama bir karar vermesi gerekiyor hakimin de şimdi. 
Tutuklayacak mı, tutuklamayacak mı? Ve Türk hukukuna ne oluyor? Tutukluyor. Tutuklayınca da ilk cihazıya kadar kalıyor kişi içeride. Fakat şimdi şeye bakın, Fransa'ya bakın, İtalya'ya bakın filan. Geçici tutuklama var İtalya'da. Bu dönmez art tasarısı bunu da önermişti. Kabul etmedi kanun koyucu maalesef. Yani hakim ilk başta bir birkaç saatlik tutukluyor ya birkaç günlük tutukluyor. Sonra onu şeye çeviriyor. Gerçek tutuklamaya çeviriyor. Ve lehte olan delilleri araştırabiliyor bu konuda. Ee, şimdi yeni bir reform komisyonu çalışıyor. Ben de onun içindeyim. Bunu önerdik tekrar Türk hukukuna getirin falan diye. Bakalım gelecek mi bilmiyorum. Yani böyle bir tutuklama kararı verip de kişiyi senelerce içeride tutmak çok ağır bir şey. O tutuklama kararının gerçi kontrol edilebiliyor falan ama karar karar. Şimdi bir hakimin verdiği bir tutuklama kararını başka hakim kaldırırken doğrusu düşünüyor. Acaba niye kaldırdı derler mi? Şey mi yaptı? Bir menfaat temin etti de mi kaldırdı bilmem ne yaptı mı falan diye. ileride kendisine bir şey gelir diye korkuyor kaldırmıyor. Ve devam ediyor tutukluluk. Bu nedenle mekanizmanın içinde olması lazım bu şey diye düşünüyoruz. Ama de, dediğiniz çok güzel bir noktaydı. Lehte olan şeyleri araştırmak için vakit gerekiyor. Bir de hocam savcı olarak bakış açısı aslında şey değil Amerika gibi değil bizde. Yani biz hani L olarak da düşünmek durumundayız. Kaldı ki bir de şimdi orada şöyle bir şey hani yağma yoktur dedik ama şimdi tipik bir usulü tekrar bakınca karar da var. Hızlı tutuşu sonradan yağmaya dönüşmesi. Şimdi vatandaş içeri girmiş. Malı almış. Tam hakimiyeti geçirmeden mağdur ona e, direnme veya bir şekilde karşı koyduysa orada diyor ki artık yağmaya dönüşür. Dolayısıyla yağma suçuna bakıyorsunuz. A, B, D, E, B. Dört tane fıkrayı birden ihlal etme durumu söz konusu. Daha bakın iddianame tazim etmedi savcı. Böyle olunca savcı biraz da ağırından düşünmek durumunda kalınca delilere deniz toplamayınca tutuklara sevk öncelikli olmuş oluyor bizim hukukumuzda hocam. Teşekkürler. Çok güzel söylüyorsunuz. Bak ikinci ayrıntı ne kadar önemli. Hakimiyette geçirdi mi geçirmedi mi? Bu, Detaylarda saklı. Detay bunu değiştiriyor. Şimdi evden almış, çıkmış. Koridorda eğer bu karşılaşıp da o koridorda vurduysa yağma değil. Ama evin içindeyken karşılaşmışlarsa daha çıkartamadan şey, şey, değişiverecek olay. Yani bu nedenle şimdi müdafiğin buna dikkat etmesi gerekiyor. Yağma değildi demesi lazım filan. Öbür de yağmaydı demesi için olay çok önemli. Olayın ayrıntısı. Peki arkadaşlar. Benim hocam bir de e, teşhis işlemi konusunda hukuka uygunluğu e, bende tereddüte e, yol açtı. Çünkü e, polis sonaklarına bakıldığında teşhiste e, kaplan e, e, şüpheliyle birlikte diğer e, teşhiste bulunan kişilerin fotoğraflarının bulunmadığı fotoğrafların güya yanlışlıkla polis tarafından silindiği bilgisi geçiyor. Yani polisin de e, şüphelimize yönelik böyle epeydir bir e, husumeti bulunduğunda ya da en azından onu bir an önce bir suçla e, ilişkilendirerek yakalama konusunda bir eğilimi olduğu düşünüldüğünde sanki e, teşhis işleminde kullanılan kişileri de e, Ramsey'i yönlendirici kişiler e, kişileri kullanarak e, ona e, şüpheliye aleyhine beyan verdirmeye çalıştığı gibi bir düşünce de bende uyandı. O nedenle teşhisi, teşhisin e, delil niteliğini de tartışmak gerekebilir mi acaba? En azından yeniden bir e, fotoğrafları da dosyaya girecek şekilde e, yeni kişilerden oluşan bir teşhis yapılması gerekir mi diye düşündüm. Çok doğru şeyler söylediniz. Bu teşhis meselesi çok önemli. Ve bu konuda önemli bir Amerikan kararı var. Teşhisi şey diye nitelendiriyor. Ee, dağ başından bir kaynak çıkıyor su kaynağı. Önüne gelen kocaman bir kaya var. Teşhis bu. O kaya olmasaydı nehir başka yerden akacaktı. Ama kaya olduğu için başka yerden akıyor. Yani şeyin seyrini değiştiren, nehrin seyrini değiştiren bir olaydır diyor teşhis. Şimdi bu olayda da teşhis bütün kurallara uygun yapılmazsa tamamen başka yere götürebilir. Çok güzel tespitlerde bulunuyoruz. Doğru. Onları... Hocam teşhis işlemi yenilenemez değil mi? Yani çünkü bir kere yapılıyor işlem. Çünkü görüntüden sonra tekrar tesis etmesi çok kolay olacaktır kişi için. Yasaya göre iki defa tekrarlanması lazım ama aynı şey içine tekrarlanması gerekiyor. 
Ben... Hocam belki mahkemede CMK Ali 2 yüzleştirme yapılabilir en fazla artık. Şimdi geriye dönük olmaz ya artık yargılama başladıysa hakim sorar bu muydu diye belki bir daha sorabilir bir ihtimal. Yani ama dikkat ederseniz ilk defa yüzleştirmenin orada yapılacağını söylüyor. Yani daha evvel karşılaşmamış olanların yüzleştirilmesi o. Eğer daha evvel teşhiste karşılaştırmaz, karşılaşmış iseler tam da yüzleştirme olmuyor. Doğru ama yargıtay bozmaları var e, Sayın Hocam. Şey diyor artık, hani bak, geriye dönük yapamayacağınıza göre diyor, yargılama da başlamış. O zaman diyor yüzleştirin. Hani başka çare kalmıyor çünkü. Yani oradaki yani. tanıma diyebilirsiniz. Bak teşhisle tanımayı ayrın birbirinden. Teşhiste hiç tanımadığı bir kişiyi buydu diye belirliyor. Ama tanımada benim tanıdığım kişi buydu diye gösteriyor. Mesela bizim mahallemizin bakkalıydı. İşte bakkalda budur dediği vakit tanıma oluyor o. Ama ilk defa gördüğü bir kişiyi, hiç hayatta görmediği bir kişi ilk defa şey yaparsa o da teşhis oluyor. Peki, o zaman haftaya daha güzel bir tartışma yapacağız. Altyapısı oluşturduk inşallah. Kendi aranızda takımları oluşturun ve konuşun lütfen. Bol bol konuşalım. Bir söz isteyen mi var? Bir el gördüm. Tebrik ediyor hocam. <gülüyor> Yok hocam çok güzeldi. Alkış göndermek istedim. Teşekkür ederim. <gülüyor> Peki hepinize iyi akşamlar. Yarın unutmayın. Hocam teşekkür ederim.